What's up, brother? <laughs> How's it going, brother? <laughs> we doing all right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Welcome to the Against All Odds podcast. I'm here with Maxi Rodriguez. Maxi, to, uh, to break the ice, I'll just ask you a whole bunch of rapid fire questions. We'll get into it and then we'll go into your full story. That sound good? Yeah, sounds good. So, age? Uh, 28. Position? Um, wow, that one's a toss up. I'm a center mid. <laughs> I can be a defensive center mid, or now I can be an attacking. When's the last time you played the six? Um, I played a bit of it last year, but even then, like, I just have, I, I'm told to get in the box, but also be a six, so it's tough. So you cover like nine miles a game, though, so it works. Yeah, I mean that. I sometimes I don't even realize I'm running that much, <laughs> but I think the last time I played the six, like for sure, for sure, was whenever I played for Richmond, so 2019. Okay, 20. Professional games played in the USL regular season. A hundred. <laughs> there we go. How about you? 150 hey, now. 150. That's nice. We did it together. That's cool. That it was on the same day. Yeah. That was a cute little story. I like yeah. that. Um, let's go. Team of the week. Player of the week. Last nomination. Um, this week. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. Uh, player or was it goal of the week that you're up for? Or is it player I'm of the month? Player of the month. Okay. USL player of the month nomination last one when was that um this this month <laughs> yeah a crazy month huh hey i'm about to buy a lottery ticket have you ever got usl player of the month before no this is the first time so vote yeah, yeah go vote <laughs> yeah it's probably gonna be up by the time this is out though no that's all right still still go and vote maybe if that's crazy you, vote, you just continue vote every 30 oh, minutes i have mimi i told you downstairs just <laughs> constantly voting that's that's really cool it's a big month for you you've had two goals two assists to start off the season You've been nominated for player of the month, or you are player of the month, or you're nominated for player of the month. You've got player of the week. It's going well, 100 appearances. It's definitely leading towards a high on like the roller coaster of your career right now, I feel like. Is that true? Yeah, for sure. I thought I peaked two years ago, and I thought I fooled everyone by thinking <laughs> I'm way better than what I am, but luckily I'm, everything's still going well. So mm -hmm. hopefully peaking now or, or getting close to it yeah that's good that's really good it's it's when you have those moments in your career you just got to capitalize on it like just keep on going yeah let it keep on flowing because every time you touch the ball things are going well you shoot things are going in i have i've never had one of those periods but they sound really nice yeah i went through a similar period two years ago where i mean i was shanking a ball top of the box and it was like deflecting off someone and going in that's i feel like that right now but i think it's much more enjoyable this team in general is just so much fun to play on yeah it's a good team it's, i mean you guys have always had a really good team too but then this year i feel like adding a little bit of pieces it's been it's been looks really good yeah so all right more rapid fire questions uh favorite dessert oh that's tough there's so many i'll probably do ice cream sandwiches like within <laughs> like in a cookie like a warm cookie and then ice cream cookie it's mm -hmm. so good what, what do you what's your go-to chocolate chip cookie and vanilla ice cream or? yeah Vanilla bean ice cream. Yeah. So getting yeah. a little bougie with it, but yeah. Um, yeah, it's my favorite. Okay. Favorite vacation destination. Wow. Sad that you say that because I honestly can't remember the last time I went on like a proper vacation. You don't do any uh, off season vacations? No, because Cameron's working, my girlfriend's working and that's her busiest time of year because she, mm. uh, where she works. So it's tough this year, hopefully kind of planning something. I just need something where it's all inclusive. Yeah. I want to eat. I want to drink. I want to just sit back and not worry about a thing that's the best yeah we did it for our honeymoon we went to the maldives and we had the all-inclusive oh, resort yeah best vacation ever yeah i need to do that best i need two ever. weeks where no one contacts me yeah i can have some alcohol i can mm -hmm. drink or eat whatever i want like most off seasons but <laughs> and i just want to get after it yeah yeah that's 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 the best i've done one of those in mexico and one in the maldives and they're just where in mexico uh, it was Cancun. Yeah. But I was too young to drink. It was just food. I was like 12. Oh. I was with my whole family. <laughs> yeah, I was like, whoa, you're going to after it 12 years old, though? <laughs> the ice cream went crazy. Yeah, though. bro. The ice cream was sick. <laughs> the vanilla bean. <laughs> Literally. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, inside joke. Inside joke. Is inside it, joke. Yeah. There you go. Now let's do uh, favorite team. Favorite team. This is where I get a lot of slack because I have two teams. One's Barcelona and one's Arsenal. Mm -hmm. so Which those, one do you love more? I think if you had, like, if I was forced to pick one, it'd, it'd be Barca. Okay. That's tough to hear. Yeah. Are you 
Madrid fan or no Arsenal fan? You're just I know it's turning just, your back on Arsenal. I think so. I didn't watch soccer, but anything but Mexican soccer mm-hmm. until I was like thirteen. So I didn't yeah. even know it existed. Yeah. And then there's players like Rafa Marquez or certain players that went to play for um, Barca, and he was Mexican, so I'd watch them. The Ronaldinho thing was going crazy. The mm-hmm. Joga Bonito commercials, and mm-hmm. I was like, "Who are these people? They're doing all these things." And I looked into it, and then that's where my kind of fascination with European soccer came. Yeah, that makes sense. So Barca kind of started that. Joga Bonito. I remember those commercials. They yeah. were the sickest Dude, thing. So sick. Or even the commercial with Ronaldinho hitting the crossbar yes. and it come back and yeah. he opened the boots and they're like gold yeah. and they're like, uh, oh, I have the worst story when it comes to those boots. It was blister? No. Yeah. So back then I used to get my cleats at Academy. Yeah. Like my dad would take me and I'm, and I got the gold boots and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm opening them up every 30 minutes. Like, yeah. oh my God, I got these. It's crazy. And there was like, I didn't know there was fake cleats and rake. Or not mm. fake, but just the lower tier. The lower tier. Yeah. And so then I kept noticing, like, well, he's got an R and a ten on his, yeah. and I'm like, oh no, they're the same boot. They're the same boot. They just got them specialized because they're for him. And then I go to uh, like a club practice, starting a new club. It's like more competitive. Uh. <laughs> and I go there, and there's this kid with the R and the ten, oh, no. and he later became one of my really good friends. It's just like I was devastated, mm-hmm. and he had the real ones, and I just felt like I had the. Did fake they make ones. fun of you? No, no, no. They were nice about it. But okay. I, I, in my head, I go, I really thought I was him. <laughs> then you weren't. Yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't. <laughs> I was, it was tough. Yeah. And you only make that mistake once. And then you realize. Then yeah. you learn the levels. You learn the pro, all the little standards, elite versions. And he, then it, yeah, you and lock then in. Christmas and birthdays from then on were just straight boots. Yeah. That's what you got to do. I had the, uh, the R10 ones too, but they were like the black and like maroon. Yeah. Uh, and... I had them in for indoor and outdoor and I got the worst blister on the sole because they like they would stretch with the leather and I have a really skinny foot and I got the worst blister of my life. Yeah. Were they like, because they came out with ones that were just maroon. Were they those or were they black? They were black with maroon. I think it was like a different colorway of those same ones. Though. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think I, think I remember. It was back like probably 2009, 2010. Yeah, feels like ages ago. <laughs> it's it's a, a long time yeah, ago. Yeah, so long. Because you're 28. Yeah, I'm You're getting up there. <laughs> I'm getting up there. How long do you want to play for? I don't know. I, I think I think about this a lot. And you asked me a couple of years ago, I'd been like, look, I'm just trying to play. And then now it's kind of like I'm getting to the age where I'm thinking about stuff post soccer. But I'll, like you said, it, like things are going well. So it's like maybe I can just continue to try to convince people I'm decent at soccer for mm-hmm. a couple more years. So we'll see um, how many, I, I think maybe three to four. Mm-hmm. I think I can manage, but I don't know how long I can keep running. So. <laughs> so you think your body's gonna be the thing that holds you back when you get to like 32 or is it gonna be the mental where you're just like i can't do usl this long no it won't be mental because i've i've gone through some tough times where it's like I, i've overcome that like everything else is kind of a piece of cake mm-hmm. i think it's going to be physical four years of key worth definitely took some years off off my career <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah i think maybe early 30s who knows maybe like three four more years that's still young man you're early 30s you're flying <sighs> well hopefully if i if i take care of my body i just like these past couple of years i'm like starting to learn how to take yeah. care of my body and, and do the right thing what do you think has been the biggest thing that you've learned that's helped the most <sighs> i think re- getting in a routine yeah like routine for me like in the off season is what i struggle with it's like not having that routine mm-hmm. is so tough or like off days like i hate off days because i don't know what to do with myself but going in early having exercises doing stuff after just being there as much as possible Mm -hmm. that's why in off season like there's players that will take like a month steve-o was just like i took like a full month off two months off as i take seven to ten days and i struggle with that lack of uh rigidity lack of routine but then i'm back training four or five days a week because i know like as soon as i get out of it my body getting back into it it just it breaks down yeah i'm the same way so and i then have to be in i it. feel guilty when i eat badly yeah because i i love to eat in off seasons or mm-hmm. drink some wine or have a beer with dinner and stuff like that yeah so not doing like doing nothing i just feel so guilty yeah yeah then i i take like two days over thanksgiving i take three or four days over christmas but then other than that it's four or five days a week of training yeah. working out like i agree the whole i probably overdo it yeah in off seasons yeah. which i rather be 
I'd rather be like, you know, I should slow down rather mm-hmm. than oh, I got to pick it up and make up. Yes, bro. When getting fit, when you're unfit is the worst. It's terrible. It's the worst. And when you're coming to preseason and you feel unfit and guys are flying around, you just, especially for me, when I, I'm not the guy, I can't be doing what you're doing and, and chopping people. And doing I'm not <laughs> chopping people. Sometimes I just step try to, overs. no, step over. There's no way that's my game. I feel like I am unfit. Sometimes when I come into preseason, uh-huh. but there's just this fear of like looking yeah. bad that makes me able to like just yeah. run. Yeah. And then, yeah, I kind of make up for it with that. But I tried to just get lost in the off season of just working so much that it's like, okay, I'm fit. Like mm-hmm. this past off season, I probably did too much, but I'd rather do that than, like mm-hmm. I said, not do enough. Yeah. And there's like these things I was reading too with injuries where you get, you're most likely to get injured with a drastic change of your workload. So it's like when you go from nothing and then start ramping up again, that's where you're most likely to get injured. Yeah. But if you just maintain, 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 obviously your body can break down over too long, but you're less likely to have like a muscle strain yeah. during that It's time. like putting your body through war. And it, once you go to training, it's like, oh, you've already done that before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Instead of like doing it for the first time, you're having mm-hmm. two days for preseason or you do a run and a lift and you're like... I guess you get injured more whenever your body's that yeah. fatigued. Remember that long off season? Was it going into 2021? Where it was like four months? That was when I didn't have a club. Really? Yeah. That was between Richmond and Detroit City? Yeah. Okay. That that was a tough time. That was awful. Yeah. <laughs> was that the... So I remember even listening to your post-game speech after Indy when you were talking about your 100 games. You said there's a lot of ups and downs. Was that the lowest period of your career right there? Yeah. For sure. I think even Richmond was a tough year. And then I was like, all right, this is a sacrifice year of going through a tough time to then come out on the other side and and it be better. And Mm -hmm. then it was the complete opposite. You thought you could hit rock bottom and then it was tougher after that. Mm -hmm. And that's not to discredit Richmond. It was just my personal situation there. And then, yeah, and then ended up going, okay. I did my time. I was a captain of the team. We didn't do well, but I got a lot of minutes. And then, okay, I'm going to find a club, hopefully USL championship. Mm-hmm. And then it went from that to nothing. And then didn't have a club. Actually went on trial with San Antonio, a team that I had already been signed with. Mm-hmm. The coach knew who I was, went on trial thinking, okay, I'm going to sign, be back at home. And then ended up not signing and yeah, having a year with no club was really tough. Yeah, that's. I think that's the hardest part for me is the spells of free agency. Even like in every off season that I've had, most of the time, like there's only been a couple where I've signed before Christmas. Yeah, and most of the time it's in January, and like I tell myself every year, like don't worry, don't get too stressed about it, you know. But oh. then every day that ticks on, you watch, you follow on the USL fan page and you see oh, all the, every player signed. I had to unfollow them. Or I'm, getting, uh, getting DMS from other people like, Hey man, like, going? where are you going? Stuff yeah. like that. I've learned that I don't do that with anyone now. Like I don't ask mm-hmm. anyone, Hey, like you got a club or where are you going? Cause we've all been in those situations. Yeah. I think this past couple of years were the first time in my career where I'm like, Oh, I know what I'm doing next mm-hmm. year. Like I'm fine. But every off season was so stressful. You're like, all right, there's plenty of time. Like, yeah. Oh, the big fish are going to go first. Like I was always like, there's bigger fish than me. Why yeah. would I be one of the first ones signed? And then as time goes on, you're like, oh no, like things are going to work out. And then Christmas comes, you're like, all right, what's going on? Maybe, oh, they're busy. Christmas. Yeah. Come yeah. on. <laughs> they're busy. They're busy. Christmas. And yeah. then after that, just nothing. And you're like, everyone's asking you, your family's asking you like, Hey, where are you signing? Where are you going? Mm-hmm. And it's just, uh, mentally is such a tough thing to go through. Yeah. And I think because a lot of people assume that once you get a contract or you have some su- success that you're guaranteed to play for however long until you want to stop at the same level that you're doing it. But like people like coaching, the coaches, the teams have such short term memories that if you're not coming off a great season, you're forgotten about. Like it doesn't matter how good your season was two years ago. You can be easily forgotten. And then all of it, like the people and the teams that you know, if you lose contact with or the coaches that you know get fired or sacked or whatever, you can run out of options fast. Yeah. And it's tough. Yeah. I feel like teams like a player and you find out that they like you and they're like, okay, great. And then you don't realize there's like five other guys that mm-hmm. if you're not the option, then they already signed this guy. Oh, we're not interested in you. Yeah. The amount of times where I've been like, yeah, we really like you. Like, I think an offer's coming. And then 
a phone call comes after a week of texting them like, Hey, what's going on? Mm -hmm. Oh, we had to go a different direction and stuff like that. So yeah, that was what, one of the best clubs I've dealt with or the best coaches I did was tab Ramos. He like literally told me you're number two right now for the right backs. We're looking at the first right back is, uh, is from DC United. We're going to see if we can get him on loan. If we can't get him, then we're going to talk to you. So that's why we're interested, but we're telling you where you're at. Like it was so blunt. Yeah. I was like, well, that's that transparency is like, I was like, okay, for a player, you rather yeah. that than someone just tell you BS and just yeah. ends up not being true. You get your hopes up. You tell your family, Oh, well maybe they, they contacted me and then, <laughs> like, Oh, Hey, what happened with them? You're like, Oh yeah, that didn't work out. Or haven't heard back from them. Yeah. It's, it's that off season period. It's tough, but like, it's good now, especially too. there's more two year contracts, more options. Uh, I guess way better at the beginning, like back at when you're at San Antonio the first time, yeah. most of it was nine month contracts. So like yeah. most, every single player had that every single year. And it was just an option. Mm -hmm. And if they picked it up, you weren't paid through the off season, mm -hmm. at least my contract. Cause it was my rookie one. So yeah, most weren't. Like, yeah. It's yeah. tough. Yeah, because this is your, what number of seasons is this for you? This is my seventh. Seventh season. Three, four, yeah, seven. Wow. As a professional. It's getting up there. Yeah. You feeling better on the field, like, as you get more experienced? Yeah. I think that's the biggest thing to my game is, like, my first two years, I was so upset that I wasn't playing. And my first year, I can argue that I wasn't ready. But my second year, I felt like I was ready. But obviously, playing time is everything. Mm -hmm. So in order to gain someone's trust, you got to get more playing time. And as I've gotten playing time over these last couple of years, like the game is so much slower. I know mm -hmm. what I have to do in certain games if we're losing, if we're winning, stuff like that. It just comes with experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, now let's go back. Let's rewind all the way to to young Maxi. You're born in San Antonio, right? Yes. What's your family look like, situation? Walk me through all that. Was it a football family? How, how did it look? Yeah, so my my dad never played a, at a super high level, but both my parents are from Mexico. My dad played in the neighborhood. And he, um, when my brother was born, he was also born. My siblings were born in Mexico, and then they moved to the U.S., and I was the only kid born in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So... My brother started playing at a really early age, and I wanted to do everything my brother did, like most uh, siblings. So that's when I started playing. And uh, yeah, my dad would would kind of coach me in ways, mm -hmm. but at the same time, I was watching so much soccer with my brother or on TV that I kind of learned and kind of realized I had a natural ability to play. Mm -hmm. So you played from like as early as you can remember? As three years old. I did think. you play any other sports? Um, I'd never played like... I guess a couple years of like official like basketball or football in, in middle mm -hmm. school but every day my friends were playing a different sport mm -hmm. so my neighbors were family friends that i saw up today and there's four boys and it was me and my brother so mm -hmm. we'd either play knockout home run derbies yeah flag football like just stuff like that and then soccer was kind of like the only thing that me and my brother did mm -hmm. so i played a lot of sports outside of like I guess recreation or, or team sports, but we did a lot in the streets and yeah. just random stuff. It's funny, like that's such an American upbringing where it's it's a different sport every day. Yeah, like whatever was on TV or whatever season it is, that's what you're playing. Yeah, like we would do like random things. Like my friends had like darts. We'd get to a phase <laughs> where we're just playing darts, and then other phase where we're playing like football and even boxing in the front yard like just random things that we <laughs> guys do. were doing some illegal <laughs> boxing in the front yeah yard. i remember videotaping it my friends would laugh but we were doing some weird things as kids we were playing like soccer with our bikes like we were just mm -hmm. random things but i credit a lot of like how i play soccer to like how the fact that i played so many other sports just mm -hmm. with my friends like just basketball and the kind of hand coordination like yeah what you're learning how to defend like just weird a lot of it translates like i think like yeah. even for i was big on basketball my dad was a basketball player basketball coach and like even like the movements of like a one two it was just a give and go in basketball defending forcing somebody outside and I, it's like all the same yeah but it's just slight with your hands versus with your feet so like i was able to like i felt like the same thing playing basketball playing all these other sports yeah you weren't developing like the technical ability but like the tactical understanding of what to do as an athlete it all just translate from every every yeah. sport. It's funny because it's like when you play those sports, it's just so simple. Like yeah. it's like, of course, that's the obvious thing to do is force them outside. Mm -hmm. Then you realize that you play with guys or or throughout your career where it's not as obvious. But mm -hmm. I credit like playing other sports and like seeing other types of 
tactics that you could learn from other stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, even like a pick in basketball or like I did it instinctually in soccer on a corner kick yeah and like they're like oh good play like i like that i'm like i just that, that's just basketball that's just, that's just smart yeah. <laughs> yeah i i go home a lot and none of my friends play soccer but they get in these like adult flag football leagues mm -hmm. and they always put me as like safety or a corner and it's just like so obvious yeah. that it's like playing a center mid or playing mm -hmm. center back like and they're just like, dude, you're so good at football. Like, you should have played. I was like, should have played NFL, like, man. No, dude. First of all, I'm way too small. Also, it's like so obvious. Yeah. Like that's what you have to do. Mm -hmm. but, so you're playing all these sports growing up, uh, but soccer was the your favorite one. Do you think you'd say? Yeah, for sure. It was the only one that I was like noticeably very talented in, mm -hmm. and I think from a young age I was like, oh, Max is a soccer player. Max is a soccer yeah, player. Yeah, it was yeah. Elementary, middle school. I think most of us. Can relate to that so mm -hmm. yeah soccer was the one where i kind of spent most of my time if i was alone going outside to juggle and stuff mm -hmm. like that when you were training like by yourself uh, that's what it looked like was just a lot of juggling like did you have any other drills were you training to get better like or was it just like having fun like how did what was your mindset from like five to ten did you want to be a pro or were you just doing it for fun i i found something from elementary school and at that age i wanted to be an nba player yeah <laughs> but which was like the for cool, the spurs yeah so yeah. the spurs were like in san Antonio, the greatest thing ever mm -hmm. and still are but um Is i remember that like the tim duncan era with uh, that's why i wear 21 oh really because of tim duncan oh wow yeah. that's cool like he's my go <laughs> that's awesome um but I, I never went to like a field. We had fields near my house, but the grass was always super long. Mm -hmm. So I never did that. But in my street, there's like obviously a street and two curbs and the curbs are like perfect to pass mm -hmm. on. Yeah. So I'd pass. Sometimes it would go perfectly on the ground. Sometimes it would go at my chest. So I'd practice passing it, receiving it on my chest or thigh, turning and going to the next curb. Mm -hmm. So little things like that, even like passing on an angle, receiving it, croifing turn, like mm -hmm. just random things like that. And then like watching the Jogo Bonito videos and yeah. being like, oh, let me try to recreate what yes. he just did. <laughs> like stuff like that. And I'd spend hours outside until I got it. I remember watching Kicking and Screaming. Mm -hmm. I remember it was like passage to the Italians. Yeah. And one kid held it on his neck. Yeah. And I was like, I will not stop until I can do that. Mm -hmm. So I'd just be outside for hours <laughs> doing that. Bro, I saw a video in the, one of the Jogo Bonito commercials where Ronaldinho did like two around the worlds in a row. And I'd never even seen around the world before. Because yeah. I was like, I was the same thing. I was just all basketball, basketball, basketball. And I saw that. Then I started loving Ronaldinho, watching his highlights, getting into the Barcelona and the whole European, all that stuff. But like, same thing. I'm like, I'm going to my garage right now. I'm going to keep on training until I can do that around the world juggling trick. And then I was like, I couldn't understand how he did it. So I would have the old desktop. So I'd run back in, I'd pause yes. it, play it yes. and keep on pausing and playing to see the slow-mo. I did the exact same thing. Yeah. Yeah. And it was one of those like, <laughs> Okay, I've got to perfect it. And then you're around like maybe teammates and you're juggling and you do it. You're like, oh, wow. Like yeah. you just want to like impress other teammates and friends. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I remember going through it. I'm like, how did that even happen? Yeah. And you try to rewind it and see it clear. Bro, I did that so much. Me and my brother would be staring. Oh, it comes off the side yeah, of his yeah, foot yeah, yeah, slightly yeah. with it. Yeah, okay, exactly. let's go back. You run back out in the garage. But like, it's crazy. Like all that, like juggling, hitting off the curb, turning, all those like simple things that you can do anywhere. It's so important to work on. Like it, it helps so much. Yeah. You don't even re side. realize it because you're a kid. So yeah. you're just trying to have fun and mm -hmm. stuff like that. You're as imagining you get, stuff. As you get older, you realize how much it transfers over things that you built as a kid, just habits that you're mm -hmm. now like, oh, that is it still in my game. Like, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. And then, so when did you start playing competitive, like club year round soccer? What age? I don't remember exactly. I think I was around 11. Mm-hmm. No, maybe, maybe younger, probably like eight or nine, just because, so I was playing in just my neighborhood league and it was kind of like ASO stuff. So it was just like fun stuff. And one of my friend's dad saw me playing and I was, I mean, at that point I was scoring like eight to 10 goals a game. Like grandpa would give me a dollar for every goal. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to score mm -hmm. and they talked to my mom and my mom ended up taking me to a practice. I did really well and started playing. Yeah, I think eight or nine is when I started playing. Mm -hmm. And then at this point, did it start to switch that you wanted to be a professional soccer player or were you still basketball? No, I think I was still basketball. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I was the same. I, I don't think it hit me till I was like maybe 12 or 13, like yeah. a little bit older. But yeah, for me, like watching the Spurs were like the coolest thing ever. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to be Manu Ginobili. Bro, I wanted to be Tracy McGrady. 
Dude, he was so sick. Was, I had, had his all shoes. Of, I had his <laughs> shoes as well. I had his and Allen Iverson's shoes. AI, bro. His AI had his the face answer. on the bottom yeah. of the shoe. I didn't know. And I, I remember I'd like light. I wouldn't run in those shoes because mm-hmm. if his face disappeared, I'd be devastated. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, I had the Trace McGrew with like the spiderweb blue yes. lines. Yeah. I had those. Those I, were so sick. Bro, they were so sick. And then he roasted the Spurs once, and mm-hmm. I was like, Oh, I have a shoe. T Mac. It's it devastating. T Mac. He, he was, was unreal. He was so <laughs> he was, sick. His shorts were so baggy. Yeah, 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 yeah. He was so good. Yeah, I loved it. But then, so you kind of mentioned it, but like around like 12, 13, for whatever reason, like you almost get identified more as a soccer guy because you're better at it or whatever reason. For me, it was just because I was playing club. I was in one of the better teams in state. And in basketball, I was like, I was really small. So I wasn't like excelling. But I loved it. But everybody kept on saying like, oh, yeah, the soccer guy he's yeah. a soccer guy. And then it kind of just became my identity. And that's when I found Ronaldinho and all that stuff. And it, that's when I dove head first. It was like, I'm the soccer guy now. I'm, it's all soccer. Yeah. And like that's when it switched. Did you have like any moment like that where it switched for you? No, I think I think I'd naturally gravitate it because my dad would every Sunday wake up and put soccer. So it's mm-hmm. like I a lot of times still do. I want to like impress my dad or, mm-hmm. or make him happy so i would just gravitate towards soccer and i was obviously realizing that i was very good and so were my parents so it was kind of just the perfect situation mm-hmm. for me that's funny yeah we didn't have my dad was from wyoming he he was white yeah <laughs> i never said that he was a white <laughs> so he was just basketball american football baseball and so like never had soccer on but he was so supportive of me he was just like pushing me to play it like because i was good and i was so tiny i was gonna get killed on the football field do you find that because your dad didn't know much about soccer it was almost like easier at the beginning but then he started understanding it and then he would get mad that i wouldn't i wouldn't play well or anything yeah. like you can still see if someone's doing well so like he would still get like put a lot of pressure on me to do well. Yeah. So at the beginning, yeah, it was just all fun. There was no pressure. Basketball and baseball I associated with more like the technical training. Soccer is just like, yeah, I just go kick the ball around. But as I got older, he got more and more into it. He started watching EPL games at like my high school level. And I was, then it was. But it's funny how it parents switched. were like, like he knew nothing about soccer. And as soon as you started liking soccer, like yeah. he's like got more into it. Mm-hmm. My dad never. So my dad worked a, a lot and he was only off on Sundays and my games were on Saturdays. So my dad wouldn't go to a lot of games. So for me, it like took pressure off. Like, mm-hmm. and my mom was like, she's the goofiest person you'll ever meet. But she, you could literally, I could have the worst game. And she'd be like, oh my gosh, you were unbelievable. Out there. You did so well. Yeah. So like I never had pressure mm-hmm. like that. But the days that were my dad could go. He would sit away from my mom in yeah, the corner yeah. and he'd just stand there with his arms crossed and you could hear him eventually just a whistle and be like, step <laughs> yeah. or drop just with his hands. And it's just, I remember that pressure, but it was good. Mm-hmm. It, is, it is good because you you do have to learn to play under that pressure. And if you have, it, you do need that balance of parents because if you have just one or both that are too much pressure, you're going to be like, oh, this is too much. And if they're both saying you're the best, then you're thinking, okay, I don't need to train anymore. Yeah, So exactly. it's a good balance. So then like high school age now, are you playing on uh, academy? Are you in an academy at this age? Like what was, or just still club soccer? Would you play high school? How'd that look? No. So I, I was in high school and they made the rule where you can't do both. Okay. So then I chose academy because it was kind of, my parents told me, Hey, getting a scholarship would be ideal. And Mm -hmm. obviously that's some pressure, but uh, that's why I chose academy and yeah, it was just competitive soccer. The only thing is that my academy wasn't very good. What so was the academy? It's called Classics Elite. Classics Elite, okay. Yeah. Which the, the club still exists, but the years I got finished, they took away the academy. Do you train with them four or five days a week? How often do you train with them? Yeah, four times. Okay. And most of the time, again, my mom was like the goofiest, but she's so innocent and mm-hmm. kind of brother and sister at home as well. So she would kind of like asked multiple parents that lived nearby she dropped me off and mm-hmm. they would take me but i was going four or five times a week okay and at this point 14 or what, however old you are are you the main goal is to to get a college scholarship is that, yeah. that what you're thinking yeah okay for sure. and then were you thinking oh, i'm gonna go be a pro after that or was it just like was it not even on your mind what were you thinking no i think by then it was kind of like it was everything i thought about like mm-hmm. i would be in class practicing my signature yeah <laughs> because i i was like i need to have a good signature yeah i cop i still have ronaldinho's r uh-huh like i i copied his r like i was signing papers 24 7 like i wanted to be approached all i thought about 
all I wanted to mm-hmm. do. Yeah, I did the same thing. I had the sheet of paper out there every single time. Matt Sheldon, Matt Sheldon, 13, 13. Yeah. I, uh, did I tell you about how I drew MS-13 on my <laughs> yeah, paper? Yeah, you told and me And my that. teacher's like, look, I know yeah. you're not an MS-13. <laughs> yeah, but, it got dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this little kid was just signing MS-13. This little 13-year-old, five foot two white kid. Who Living was, where at the time? <laughs> Portland, Oregon. Yeah, they're like, <laughs> this guy's crazy. <laughs> Matt Sheldon, you do not mess with that Bro, guy. what if I just was in, in MS-13, though, and I just ran it? That'd be crazy. <laughs> yeah, I don't know who listens to this, if it's some members, but I'm not condoning anything that's being said. <laughs> Maybe, you never know. There might be a couple gang members <laughs> yeah. watching this. Yeah, they love ball. <sighs> ball is life. There we go. There we go. <laughs> All right, so you're working on your signature. You're thinking, I'm going to go pro, college soccer. And th- your thought process was college soccer, then to the pro game. Were you were Was there any chance or were you thinking about 18 signing pro? Was there any opportunities there? So my academy team was so bad. Like yeah. we, we, I lost every game 5-0, 4-0, 3-0. So like whenever we'd have the showcases, mm-hmm. they'd put in showcases, they'd put academy teams that were kind of like, you're either in the playoffs or you're like against similar teams, like the level wise. Yeah. So I remember going to showcases and just going like, okay, I have to ball out. Like this is my opportunity to like, play well in front of mm-hmm. college coaches, get a scholarship and and see what happens. So I'd go to um, showcases and I'd be the leading goal scorer for my team as like a holding center mid. Mm-hmm. So I was just trying to do everything, just running and stuff like that, trying to get attention of a college coach. At that age, I was also training with um, a pro team in San Antonio, which was NASL. Mm-hmm. So I was training with the Scorpions. Scorpions, yeah. So all, every summer I'd train with them. How did you get that? So their head coach, who's the head coach of San Antonio now, Alan, mm-hmm. was um, he trained me individually at times. Mm. So he was doing individuals and then ended up being the head coach. And he saw that I was playing at a decent level. So he invited me. And then I still their goalie coach is the same coach they have now. Um, I was playing with guys who I ended up playing with my rookie year. So it's actually really funny. There's guys in the league now that played mm-hmm. for that team, mm-hmm. which is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. That's all. Awesome. And I think that like. The individual coaching, I think, is so big because one, you get like the quality coaching from a professional level coach, but then like the relationship that you develop with them is so huge. Yeah. Like what your situation, not all the time are they going to become the head coach of San Antonio, but like even for me, I I had a one-on-one coach and he ended up was the person, long story short, who connected me with somebody who brought me over to Germany. And because I just stayed in contact with him, I was close with him, but it's just like, yeah, developing those relationships one-on-one like that whether it's with your current coach or a one-on-one coach it's like that's how the game is it's relationships connections and you have to start working your way into that like yeah 100 I, that's what i struggled with my first couple of years you realize like the more you build connections the more that like people know you or this guy goes to this club and mm-hmm. they'll say good things about you and stuff like that or mm-hmm. even just like my college coach ended up being a coach that i had when i was 13 yeah and he remembered and he kept in contact every year after that with the club I was still at. And the big reason why I went to that university or got a scholarship was because of him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it is crazy how it works. And I always tell kids, they're like, I don't have any connections right now. I'm like, well, you, what you see right now, like it's going to, everybody wants to go up. Your club coaches want to go higher. Your one-on-one coaches want to coach somewhere. Your current teammates are going to be at higher level one day. So like, that's your web. You just got to develop that. And then it will expand over time naturally. So that's that's cool though. So you went to Charlotte 49ers, right? That's yeah. Then you went there because your your U13 coach, he was your club coach or academy coach, and then he ended up getting that coaching job. Yeah. So he was the assistant for a couple of years and they had just gone to the national championship, mm-hmm. like maybe two, three years before that. And obviously, when I'm on one of the worst teams in academy, mm-hmm. I'm losing every game. I'm like, scholarships looking tough, maybe mm-hmm. go to a local school. And I remember the funniest thing is that there's a lot of like things they look for in a Charlotte player. And even as a guy that was on the worst team, I was trying to do everything. Mm-hmm. I was trying to press. I was trying to turn and kill is what we call. So just doing way more than one player should. Mm-hmm. And luckily that got me a scholarship and the f- I didn't really have any other offers. I maybe had one university of Wisconsin, mm-hmm. but I was a Hispanic kid from South Texas. And I was like, <laughs> well, 
I have <laughs> no clue what's in Wisconsin. <laughs> so I think. Do you the, think at that age you could have pointed out Wisconsin on a map? No, no <laughs> clue. I just knew that it, there was snow involved. Yeah. So how um, did they? How did they? It was a showcase tournament they found you at. Yeah. Okay. And I, the, the, I remember the day I committed to Charlotte. I told the coach, and he like rinsed me on the phone really he like rinsed me he was like you're making the worst decision and i'm like a 17 year old kid. isn't that like, crazy when coaches do that i, I, I got rinsed at, i had fun like i that. was like dude i have no clue what's going on mm-hmm. um like i'm 17 my parents don't or never went to college in america mm-hmm. so they don't really like like most kids had their parents help them with like um signing up for scholarships or just applying to schools and yeah. stuff like that. I kind of, and not their fault. Like I, d- they didn't really help me a lot with that. Cause they mm-hmm. didn't understand it. Yeah. They just were like, Hey, you're on top of it. Right. And I'm like 17, like, <laughs> yeah, mom, I'm emailing schools before I go to showcases and stuff yeah. like that. I'm doing all of that. So when I told them Wisconsin, they're like, Wisconsin. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, but uh, Kev, your old coach, go to North Carolina. Charlotte. Right. I'm like, well, yeah, but they haven't offered me. Mm-hmm. And then luckily they did offer me. And I think I accepted like the, that same day, I was yeah. like, "Yeah, I'll take it." Yeah, and, and like, did you reach out to him first, or did he just reach out to you first? A mixture of both. He so my coach in at Classics Elite was mm-hmm. a good friend with him, so they would just stay in contact, and he would kind of be like, "Hey, Kev's watching." Like, mm. and I wanted to quit club because I was just getting my ass kicked. Like, yeah, I, every I was playing Kellen Acosta on the weekends, <laughs> just getting beat five zero. Yeah, like it was miserable. And Texas has amazing programs yeah and so san, like, san antonio is just recently like getting up to the levels of mm-hmm. like dallas yeah but at the time you go to dallas and like you're playing against unbelievable players guys that are over in europe like killing it now yeah, yeah. exactly so um luckily charlotte were interested even with me losing every game i think mm-hmm. they saw s- skills that would work for their university so yeah got really lucky yeah and it is like it's important because like even with I tell kids too that want to go and play in college. It's like go talk to your current coach and tell them that you want to play and like have even ask for help like directly because then they know, you know, they know a coach or two or whoever. But were you sending emails just like to other schools, like even without showcases? Like were you reaching out by yourself, like to UC Davis, sending them emails saying you're interested yeah, in a highlight video? I was sending emails to like <laughs> now looking back, so naive, but I mean it works out for people, but I was sending university email to universities that were like the best in the Stanford, <laughs> UCLA, uh, yeah, Stanford. Yeah, I did that too. <laughs> like just unbelievable schools. Mm-hmm. Uh, Akron at the time, like mm-hmm. uh, UNC uh, Chapel Hill. I remember I sent the wrong email to a different, to the uh, wrong coach. That. And I, I was once. like, Oh, that's why they didn't want me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I, I did that. That was the way. And he sent me the email back. He's like, Hey Matt, this is actually the coach of, Santa Cruz. No, you got to respond. I didn't get a response, but I mean, at Charlotte, I remember there's guys that came in or got, um, looked at and got a scholarship because they sent an email. Yeah. And it's like little things like that can go such a long way. Mm -hmm. We have a guy from Croatia Mm -hmm. who ended up getting drafted in in MLS. Like he sent an email and then got found for us for three years. But that's how I got all of my interest. It was all emails. And then all of them, they sparked a little interest. Like, Oh yeah, we really like your highlight video, but we want to take another look at you. And I would go to Oregon State's ID camp and then they knew me already a little bit, played well. They're like, yeah, we're really interested. But like every start was all an email for me. And I had no idea if, if you even did that. My dad was just like, yeah, just send me an email. Who cares? Yeah. I'm like, yeah, sure. Who cares? <laughs> I think I, I don't know. I think my club coach was like, make sure y'all are sending emails and stuff mm. like that. And I'm like, all right, I guess I'll just Bro, I Google a, coach's emails and yeah, do it. Yeah. I had a club coach that I told him that I wanted to go play D1 and play in college. He's like, no, you're not good enough for D1. And I told him, like, well, I'm already talking to UC Davis. Like, they're D1 in California. He's like, you can't play D1 in California. I was like, well. That's insane. I was like, okay, well. well your, job is, your job is to, like, have kids, like, have hope and yeah. follow their dreams and, like, try to help them. And this guy's like, oh, nah, yeah, there's no like, way. And so I was, like, speechless. I'm 16, 17. I'm like, I don't know what. It seems like he's interested. But then I was like, well, I told my dad about it. I was like, wow, he doesn't think I'm good enough. He's like, well, who cares? Just keep on. Yeah. Sending the email, sending the highlight videos. Look at him now. Yeah. <laughs> I'd contact that guy right now. Be like, what's up, dude? What's up, man? Bro, I don't even know where he's at right now, to be honest. I, but I'll look him up. You know where I'm at? Yeah, this. we'll I'll find him. him. We'll <laughs> find you, bro. I hope you're listening. Um, and then so were you, 
Like you had no professional opportunity, even though you had like the San Antonio, San Antonio Scorpions. Were, was there any chance that you could sign their 18? I think the contracts looking back were like not the greatest. Like it, at that time, there was no like minimum and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. it was either like guys on the high end or guys on like peanuts. You yeah. know what I mean? So it was tough. Um, I know I'd always like make a joke or they'd make a joke like, hey, maybe next year, mm-hmm. stuff like that. But I don't think there was that infrastructure that made it like ideal to mm-hmm. sign young players. When I was younger, like um, I remember going to like a Houston Dynamo camp and they wanted me to live in Houston, live with a host family and join mm-hmm. their academy. But at th- that time, I did want to leave my family. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a couple opportunities in Mexico, like going on trial with like America mm-hmm. and stuff like that. But I. Again, I was like so scared to like leave my family or like try something new. Whereas like kids now are so eager to, yeah, to do all yeah, that yeah. and they're so mature to be able to do that. Mm-hmm. I realized at that age, I was not ready for that. I was not ready at all. So uh-huh. it was so scary. Even going uh, to North Carolina, like leaving my family and mm-hmm. stuff like that was so overwhelming. First time my parents saw the university was dropping me off. Mm-hmm. Like they had never seen it. I'd already, wow. I went to two ID <laughs> camps. I flew there. And there, I was like, "Yeah, it's nice." They're like, "All right, sounds good." <laughs> and then they dropped me off. They're like, "Hey, this is pretty nice." I'm like, well, yeah, like that's how like innocently naive my parents were yeah. to the idea. I think they trusted my coach. They mm-hmm. knew him, and yeah, that's important. And yeah. I mean, too, it's like trusting the player as well. Like, if you're there, you see it's nice. You'd think you'd be happy to go. It's like if a lot of times the parents are pushing a player to go it one way, then it's like, well, does do you actually want to be there? Yeah, or does your parents want thing. to be there? When parents are like too pushy and forcing mm-hmm. stuff, I think that's when like kids can like lose interest mm-hmm. so quickly. And I've seen a lot of good players who enjoy the game, but then their parents push in and they realize they're like, oh, I don't like this. Anymore. Yeah. It's just tough to see. When I had, I had an offer from Oregon State, UC Davis, and Gonzaga. And I sat down and they're all pretty much same money wise, nothing crazy. And I was like, where should I go, Dad? Like I, at this point, like, you know, your parents make all the decisions for you. You kind of like are in there like, oh, I want to play for this club team or whatever, but they're the final say. And I was like, this is your decision. This is where we are pretty much hands off. Like, this is you. Wow, and, I was like, and I was like, what? I don't know where <laughs> yeah, to go. Yeah. I'm like, and then I went to my mom, like, mom, where should I go? Like, tell me, give me information. She's like, this is your decision. You have to make it. And that was like, I lost sleep. I was like, I have no idea where yeah, to go. Yeah, that's tough. I really didn't have to make a decision like that. Mm-hmm. Like, Wisconsin was interested and they offered a scholarship, but I knew I was never going to go to Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. Like, it was just... So I think Maybe you really hated on that that state, man. No, what do you got? You got no, beef I, with Wisconsin. I actually, we visited there when I was in League One, and I yeah. was like, "This place is awesome." Maybe I should have went there, yeah. but nah. Charlotte, <laughs> Charlotte was like incredible for me, even though it was like a struggle at first. Mm-hmm. Like it was, it ultimately taught me how to be like a soccer player. Mm-hmm. Why before, is that? I think before everything was kind of like just raw talent, mm-hmm. and like because my academy team didn't have the resources, I never really learned to like play the position a proper way Mm -hmm. it was all just natural skills and instincts and then when i went to charlotte like i went from losing every game in academy to then going to charlotte and winning every game Mm -hmm. so one it taught me how to be a winner when before it was like oh we lost again we lost again now it's like no losing is not like if you lose so much it becomes a habit yeah And Uh, and you like have those tendencies of having that mentality Whereas like it went to Charlotte and it was like immediately, no, it's a winner's mentality. Mm -hmm. So adjusting to that was different. Adjusting to like winning college soccer games is way different than just like being an academy and being a Hispanic in South Texas. Like, yeah, play. Yeah, yeah. Feet, Mm -hmm. feet, feet. So like you learn how to be a winner in different ways, which is way different than what I had in academy. Yeah. And because there's more, like you go up one more level, it's like, now these wins mean something like it really is important. Like guys will lose their job. Yeah. You know, and then exactly. like it's it's a whole bunch of more weight just added, added on. And it's not the most pressure because obviously, you know, there's less pressure in college than there is at the pro level, less pressure at our level than there is at the prem. But like it starts ramping up a little bit. Uh, did you like the school? Were you happy there? Like immediately, did you have any problems adjusting to like living on your own, that new style of play, the winner's mentality? Like how was that transition? I think living away from home was tough. Um, I just felt like, yeah, I was around the team, but I was very alone in a way. But like everyone, it's a a new situation. But um, I had to grow up really quickly. Mm -hmm. I remember there was phone calls with my parents. Not that I wanted to leave, but struggling a lot. But 
ultimately like I even struggled soccer wise because it was so different. Like I was stepping and dropping in four, like practicing stepping oh, yeah, and yeah. dropping. Before I was like, oh, I just run a lot. Like, <laughs> I just run and go get the ball, hopefully. And mm-hmm. that wasn't working. So like everything, there was an adjustment. And then as soon as I saw myself getting better mm-hmm. or people were going, hey, good stuff and like good job today and things were clicking then it was immediately like yeah like this is fun Mm -hmm. i'm enjoying this a lot yeah like it is it is i had the same thing where college at uc davis was the first time that like i knew what a 4-4-2 was i knew the positions i knew the basic tactics from just watching the game and everything but like it is true at that youth level you're kind of like raw talent raw athleticism you just just do your thing you're kind of shut off your mind you just play yeah and there's something to that but also you need to learn how to play as a team, the positions. And then if you can, can combine those two things about understanding the exact position, where to be, the general sense of, oh, we just went down the side time to switch to the other side, all those. And then you combine that with like your instinctual play. That's where you like really are playing your best game. But like same thing for me. College was like all actually learning. Oh, I can't just take the ball from my goalkeeper, <laughs> yeah. turn and start dribbling up the field. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting, but it's also crazy that like, I wasn't really learning that at the youth level. I agree. Looking back, I'm like, <laughs> dude, I didn't know anything Nothing. about the soccer, like, about soccer. But it's almost like, oh, like we're learning that. But I kind of did that naturally. Mm-hmm. But now mm-hmm. I realize why I'm yeah. doing it or how we can help the team, stuff like that. But mm-hmm. yeah, looking back, I realized that I knew nothing about like mm. structure or position i was literally like just give me the ball yeah or oh the ball's going there let me get under the forward and stuff like that so mm. it's yeah. funny how it just naturally happens but learning it is it's pretty important yeah i was always just faster than other players so i'm like just i'm just gonna get the ball give me the ball guy would come 10 yard touch sprint oh, i down. lost that <laughs> i lost that at like 13 i was <laughs> i was like i used to be fast now every kid is faster than yeah me. Uh, so that helped me a lot because i was like well, maybe I can run more mm-hmm. and the ball's way faster than mm-hmm. anyone. So that I learned at an early age that I wasn't going to be fast. Yeah, that, that's college because then UC Davis just recruited athletes like strong, fast. And so then I was like, wow, all these guys are just as fast as me. So I was like, no, now I need to actually learn how to cut the ball. I got to throw a body faint in there every once yeah. in a while. So it was, it's a good learning experience. But yeah, it was a. It's a tough transition. I remember my first year just being so frustrated. Like, these guys are good, too. Like, everybody comes. You realize everybody comes from being the best player at their club team. Yeah. And now you're all on the same team. Yeah. And it's like, then it does happens again after college. Yeah, again, I, struggled, you know? I struggled with that a bunch. I was like, I've always been the best player growing up, yeah. no matter what. Even if I was on a losing team, I always felt like I was the best player. Then I went to Charlotte, and I was like, oh, I feel like when we do these drills, I'm the liability. Like, yeah. it was tough to deal with. Yes. And you have these seniors who you're they're counting on you for their senior year and they're like hey screaming at you like come on and stuff like that and you're just like so overwhelmed mm-hmm. it's tough yeah i remember the a rondo it wasn't at college but it was at sacramento republic and i was the liability and i'm like i don't think i've ever felt like this like i'm the i am the worst player right now yeah. on this field i struggled with rondos a lot yeah really at the professional level like charlotte we never played rondos yeah, same at Davis. Never. Like we didn't. Never. So when we were playing rondos. Which I, isn't that crazy to think about? That, it is crazy. <laughs> but I remember like we would play rondos and I'm like, I am giving the ball away every mm-hmm. time. It got to the point where I was like, ah, I'm a pass. Yeah. I'm not gonna do any, <laughs> yes. I'm not gonna do rondos today. I'm just gonna pass. Yeah. Cause I was that nervous. It was, this was at San Antonio, your yeah. first year. Yeah. yeah. First at year. Sacramento. I I was training with them. Same thing. It'd be the more Matt, Matt, you know, you're the youngest. We need the youngest in here. Yeah. I'm like, wow, oh, no, my <laughs> yeah. ankle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then I, I caught myself down. I was like, look, this is, I'm a liability at this. I would talk to Preki after training. He's like, you have the raw ability to be a pro, but what's holding you back is that ability to play in tight spaces, the composure on the ball. You really need to work on that. And so I was like, I just it was like, oh, every morning, here we go. Rodrigo Lopez, Ivan Mirkovich are calling me into the Rondo. I'm like, I'm going to get screamed at. They're going to laugh at me. They're going to meg me three times, but I just got to go for it. I got to yeah. do it every single day. And I got better after the nine months, way, way better. Yeah. But like, it's a terrible feeling to be the liability of the Rondo. Yeah. And then you're like, get married. And everyone's like, ah, and they're running around screaming. You're they're like, pantsing you. And you're like, <laughs> <laughs> their video guys just posting it. You're like, come on, man. Yeah. <laughs> Try list number 42 gets humiliated. Yeah. Like, yeah, it was tough, but it, it's, you improve those parts of your game and then you bring it to the point now where it's like you don't feel like a liability of the rondo you feel like you're excelling you're the one doing megs it's amazing yeah and you also have all the ability that you had before whether it was your work rate your speed whatever your speed that you got 
all that kind of stuff. <laughs> no speed at all. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's, it's good. So four years of at Charlotte, what were like some of the highs, the lows there? Like do you, anything sticking out to you over those four years? Cause you went there for four years, right? Yeah. I went there for you four there years. My, my guy, Pat Hogan. Yeah. What a legend. Todd, <laughs> my guy, Todd. Todd. So, so my first year, like I struggled and then I, as the year went on, I was doing better and better. And I mm -hmm. felt like there's days where I'm just the best player on the field. Yeah. And then there's other days where I'm not, but I'm still doing like things that I would do in Academy where it's like, mm -hmm. I'm turning where I shouldn't be turning. Yeah. Yeah. I'm pulling it off, but that trust that you have to have with your coach, like they have to trust you in, in the game. And mm -hmm. I didn't have that trust. And then my coach would have conversations, conversations with me saying, look, you were the best player at training today, hands down but you're doing Cruyffs on the top of your own box to get out of situations that, mm -hmm. yeah, it worked, but in a game it might not work. Yeah, that one out of 10 times that doesn't work, we lose that game. Yeah, so it was really just a learning experience my freshman year. Mm -hmm. I played a bit, but not enough to where I would redshirt, mm -hmm. but enough to where I learned and learned from the guys above me who are really good players. And then sophomore became like the, the starting center mid mm -hmm. for Charlotte. And the, my sophomore and junior years were my best years, mm -hmm. especially my junior year. Everything was going smoothly, did really well. Um, projected to, to get drafted the next year mm -hmm. my, after my senior year, which was exciting, but then had a tore my meniscus in preseason of my senior year. Um, it was like four weeks before the season start. They ended up, I went into surgery, not knowing whether it was going to be a repair mm -hmm. to a point where I red shirt or it was going to be a scrape. And it's just, four weeks of rehab. Mm -hmm. So it ended up being a scrape, which is good, but college is so quick. You yeah. have two games a week. It, it's literally put into like maybe six, seven weeks, yeah. maybe a little bit more. And I just never got fit, was mm -hmm. not eating very well, was not doing the things that would take me to the next level, mm -hmm. which I think a lot of kids do in college. Mm -hmm. I think looking back, I would have definitely used the resources of my university way more than what i did because mm -hmm. i definitely didn't use like the them. training room the treatment room all that kind of stuff yeah the gym no, the, just yeah. the fields the balls like you realize the usl is awesome and being a professional is awesome but these billionaire like these billion dollar facilities or million dollar facilities that universities have are sometimes better than what you have as a pro mm -hmm. and there's so many resources that can help you get to that next level yeah. which i didn't use enough mm-hmm that was the one thing that I was really proud about myself that I did it from sophomore, freshman, junior, all every year was like every, I'd say f three times a week, especially in the winter, spring, summer, like hitting up teammates, let's go train, let's do extra work, like open up the shed with the balls and you get, you know, shooting on goal, empty nets or whatever. Like I had a really good group that all really wanted to go play pro. And we actually all did, all of us signed in yeah. the usl everywhere but like we all were like let's go train let's do extra let's do extra and so like, we really took advantage of like the facilities and like what we had there the beautiful bermuda grass fields yeah, and everything i missed, the grass. I missed that yeah <laughs> yeah no i i regret not using those resources as much as i could mm -hmm. and and the players that did use it went on to like not have an easier road but you could see that their work later paid off mm -hmm. whereas sometimes i think i got complacent and like Oh, well, I'm playing every game. I'm mm -hmm. playing really well. Like, I don't need to do that extra stuff. And mm -hmm. that's probably my biggest regret when it comes to, to college. Yeah. I think the biggest thing for me with doing that was seeing other players. Cause I, in Sacramento, we had a guy like Conti Colacotronis. He like was like, Oh, let's go train with Jaleel and Ibaba, who was in the MLS at the time. Let's go train with, he knew these guys. Yeah. And so, like, I would go in at Davis and play, and you'd feel complacent. You go train with some MLS guys, you go train with these guys that were way better than you, and you'd be like, Oh, well, I am not where I should be. Yeah. And then you kind of click. So you're like, Okay, well, I wanna be there. I don't wanna be here. I need to do more. But if you're stuck in the bubble where you're the big fish, yeah. it's hard to see out of it. Yeah, like, for a lot. sure. I agree. But it's, it's, I mean, you go through, the, I went through that, like I had that same thing my, it was my sophomore year where I was super complacent. But then junior year, I saw that, was training with some pros. I'm like, I, my, my touch is shit. Like, I need to improve this. Yeah. I think for me, like going into my junior year, like after my junior year, I was like, yeah, I'm getting drafted for mm -hmm. sure. Like things are going so well. Uh, my team's winning. We're like t always like top 10 in the country. Mm-hmm. Like everything's good. And then I had my first setback that I've really had injury wise. 
And then I realized, was this maybe because I wasn't doing the right things in the off season? Mm -hmm. I didn't prepare my body like I do now or stuff like that. So I think that was a, a tough situation that ended up helping me in the long yeah. run. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And then did you end up getting drafted? Like how was your post? Did you drop out or did you finish? Um, no, I didn't finish. But I mean, I was there four years, <laughs> but I had to switch majors. You know how colleges are. They don't oh, yeah. offer this class in the spring. So you have mm-hmm. to change your major in, in order to be eligible, which is really shitty for people because mm-hmm. it just changes everything. Mm-hmm. But so I ended up after four years going, all right, well, San Antonio wants me to come into preseason mm-hmm. with like they already had an understanding of who I was. I was there the summer before um to try to sign a professional contract and looking back at it now like i didn't even prepare for that the the trial the trial like i not at all like in my head it was like well they're gonna sign me really which like i i went to like colorado Uh with my friends we drove to colorado to like just have a have like a a fun weekend there and like see snow (laughs) and i even told the coach like hey i i can be there next week i can't no isn't that insane that's now looking back like there was no reason why I should have got a pro contract. Yeah. And I went in unfit, hadn't trained, didn't touch the ball, still did really well in the preseason. Mm-hmm. And then they signed me, but not realizing that that probably, I just got really lucky and more, a lot of people work a lot harder for that type of opportunity. And mm-hmm. I kind of took it for granted. Mm-hmm. That's crazy. If I had a player say, oh, I can be there next week. And he didn't have a great excuse of, oh, I'm on trial with this MLS team or someone like that. Bro, yeah, it's crazy. I'm not talking. Yeah, I'm blocking. And I and I went in so unfit. I think I've told you before. Like I weighed 20 pounds heavier, Mm -hmm. no muscle, just like I was just not in a good. What did the your teammate call you over there? Um, my teammates there. I have a different one now, Mm -hmm. but my teammate there called me. uh, What was it? It's a food item for sure. Torta. No, tortas now. Oh, tortas now. Tortas I now. Back then. No, back then it was <laughs> you been named tamal. Two, tamal. <laughs> You've been named after two different. Yeah, Rafa food. Castillo, who's an absolute legend, like um, short guy. I mean, he's way older than me now, and he's just shredded. Like mm-hmm. this guy is just in great shape. Ran forever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he would call me tamal my rookie year because I looked. Like a torta, also. <laughs> like it, Do you I'm, think you look more like a torta or more like a tamal? Then I was a torta. Yeah. He called me tamal, which, I mean, it, mm-hmm. I definitely look like that too, but I definitely was a torta. Like okay. I was a big guy. Had no reason to be like, I was just happy to be a pro my mm-hmm. first year. Like I was still doing the wrong things. I was a pro. And I was like, I live in my home city. Like, mm-hmm. I'm not spending money because I live with my parents. So let me go out with my friends, telling everyone, hey, everything's on me. Like, I'm not getting paid <laughs> a lot of money. Yeah. And I'm like, boys, the beers are on me. Like, we're good. And I'm like, not good. Like, yeah. I did not make that much money to <laughs> be paying for that. Beers on me, but yeah. slow down. Yeah. Slow down. <laughs> so I was still doing, like, the wrong things, not eating the right things. Mm-hmm. Like, just happy to be a pro. Yeah. Having, like, being satisfied with having a couple of good days of training. Oh, I'm not mm-hmm. starting. Oh, that's all right. Like. I'll come off the bench or be on the bench. That's fine. Like just a lot of complacency and my mindset was, was pretty shitty. That's funny. So like from, that's really interesting. Where did like the confidence of like, Oh, from like, even I don't need to really prepare for this pro trial to like, even the first year of being more relaxed. Like where did that stem? Like, do you know where it stemmed from? Or is it just like, cause it came easy. Like you knew it was coming. So it like, you didn't, I think Charlotte taught me to be a winner so much that I would win. But it was like, what's the words? It taught me how to be a winner and I'd get away with it Mm -hmm. is what I'm trying to say. It's like, I didn't always deserve it and I wasn't always the best, but I'd get away with it. I'd do just enough. Mm -hmm. Whereas at the professional level, like you can only get away with that for a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. And I realized that. And then I'd made that transition between my first and second year where I was like, okay, I'm not happy being satisfied. Mm Mm-hmm. Because I had a, a conversation with a teammate. He goes, the first year is easy. Mm-hmm. Being your second, third, those are the most important years as a pro. Because those are the years where you either make it mm-hmm. or you're not cut out for it. And I took that really personal because I didn't like being called tamales <laughs> <laughs> or torta. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like I kept, it was funny, but then I realized like, 
dude, I'm getting clowned, but <laughs> I deserve to be clowned. Like I'm yeah, not yeah. doing the right things. Um, my body's not in the right shape for this. Like I need to make a change. Mm-hmm. So like, I think I dropped that off season, like 20 pounds. Mm-hmm. And I remember my goalie coach at the time, his name's Juan La Madrid. This guy's a legend. He goes, Oh, tamal, you look good. And I really made an effort to get fit because I was like, Oh, next year, like this guy's not going to be here. This guy's not mm-hmm. going to be here. Like I'm going to be the starter to then only realize they brought in Mikey Lopez and a couple other guys from the MLS who I'm like, ah, oh. but then I was in the right, um, right in the right shape to like be able to compete mm-hmm. and show that I can play at that level, mm-hmm. which was the best thing for me. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. I, th- I think that's, I mean, dropping 20 pounds is crazy. And yeah. also we just running a lot. We just eating, I was just was a eating diet. right. Yeah. And I was eating like bone in chicken thighs <laughs> and just legs and then just vegetables. Yeah. Yeah. No, and, no tamales, huh? No. <laughs> Maybe one or two during Christmas, but yeah, I was, and I was running like an, a maniac, mm-hmm. which is... I mean, that is that is true. I, I love that your coach told you that because it is true. Like the first year, yeah, you're just like, I'm here. Everyone gives you a little pass because, oh, it's his first year. It's his rookie year, you know, give him, it's okay. But yeah, the years two and three set it up if, if you're going to have a successful career or if you're going to be forgotten about ending there and, you know. Yeah, because I had glimpses. Like I'd have training sessions where, again, I was the best player on the field. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't every day. Yeah. Like, and I think the biggest thing as a professional is how consistent can you be? Yeah. Can you do it every day? Can you do it every weekend? Which I saw from guys. I was like, mm-hmm. that guy's starting. Like, I played better than him today. But every game, he was so consistent and reliable. Mm-hmm. And it took me back to my freshman year in college where I was like, told, hey, yeah, you did really well. But can we rely on you every day? Mm-hmm. So then I realized, okay, it's the same kind of thing that I learned my uh, freshman year so i just need to like double down and if i want to be in this position do everything and fight for it because it can be taken away just like Mm -hmm. that and that's like where the maturity comes in when you get older it's like a player like people say oh he plays like a 28 year old when he's a 16 year old it's like even jude bellingham all these guys because it's like they're so reliable like they're making the good decisions they're making the safe decisions when they need to they have the confidence to take people on when they should but they're not making the dumb mistakes that a lot of young teenagers make because it's like yeah it takes some time to realize that what coaches want is to trust you on the field and you need to have be reliable. You need to showcase that you can do something special, but you need to be reliable. Because the same thing now, a couple bad mistakes from one player, it can turn a season, and then now everybody's jobless. And now you're going through an off season like you had in 2020 or 2021 where you're panicking because you don't have a contract. Yeah. And it's like, it is true. I, I realized that really fast as well. It's like a coach needs to trust you. And you have to, every single day of training needs to be at a high level, consistent, reliable, safe, smart, for them to build that trust over time. It's yeah, hard. And, and that trust can be like broken as well. Like, yeah. Like it's not just something that you get and it's like, okay, I have their trust. Like mm-hmm. you have to continuously work to keep the coaches trust, your teammates trust, so they trust you on the field or training or off the field. Just, yeah, it's something that is continuous. It doesn't just come naturally. Mm-hmm. And then the second year San Antonio went better though, right? For you? It went better as a professional, me in particular, I, I still wasn't starting as many games as I thought I should be starting or getting. Mm-hmm. I was coming off the bench almost every game. I think I played like a total of 17, 18 games. Mm-hmm. So I think that's half. Mm-hmm. So I think I started maybe less than half of that. So I remember I was pretty frustrated because I felt like I was the best player, not just one day a week, two days. It was every day at training. And then I wasn't getting kind of rewarded for that. I'd start and I'd play really well Mm -hmm. two games in a row, maybe because there's an injury. And then as soon as the starter came back, like it was him instead of me, which is understandable. But as a young player, ultimately you just want to be given that trust, which you thought you earned. And I was told, Hey, Hey, you're doing really well. Like keep it up. Keep going, keep going. And at times you get frustrated as a young guy, you just want to play, play, play. But yeah, I wish I played more, but it was a better season than the year before for sure. Mm-hmm. And in my third year, I was like, all right, I don't have a contract. But at the end of the day, like no clubs knew about me. But mm-hmm. I was doing so well at San Antonio. I'm told like you're the future. Um, you're going to be our guy. Or I thought that because naturally these guys are getting older. I'm 22 doing really well. Like I, I saw myself as like a future captain of that club. And then they were kind of like, hey, 
we don't see you as a starter for next year, which was devastating for me. Mm -hmm. And also, you're not under contract. If I were you, I'd look for other clubs. And I was like, what? Like, I didn't (laughs) even have an agent. Mm -hmm. So I was like, what? I don't even know what to do. Yeah. And it was kind of a nice way of like, we're not going to re-sign you. Yeah. yeah. Which was tough to hear. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, all right, well, I'll figure it out. Like, I've played over 30 games the last two years. Like, I'll be okay. And then nothing came, nothing came, nothing came. And then the coaches, I think, still helped me, and they reached out to Richmond. And I think I signed, like, three days before their preseason started. So the coaches at San Antonio were the ones that set up the, the Richmond contract for you? Sort of. I I ended up signing an agent who, obviously, I'm not a big fish, so you bigger fish get better agents, stuff yeah. like that. But he helped me out. And then, like, I'm talking a week before – I had a phone call with the coach before preseason, and then two days later, I'm driving to Richmond with all of my stuff in my car, mm-hmm. and it was just like like that. Mm-hmm. And it was I was dropping a league. It was that mentality of first year of League One, like oh, people aren't going to be able to go down and come back up. Like mm-hmm. it was just such a mystery year. Yeah. And then this was 2019, right, for Richmond? Yes, 2019 to 2020. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then so how did? Were you like mindset going into Richmond, dropping down a league? Were you excited of like, okay, now I can really prove myself? You're thinking like I can start here every game? Or were you thinking like like more upset at the fact that you're down a league? I think both. I think I had a chip on my shoulder, but the coach also was like, hey, you're going to be our guy. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, that's exciting. I'm going to be the guy. Like I can earn minutes, show like what I can do. Mm-hmm get playing time, which I wasn't given as much in San Antonio. And I can show people that I belonged in the USL mm-hmm. championship. Um, yeah, I think chip on my shoulders, probably everywhere I've been, I always have that. So it just put a n- more, what's the word? Fuel to the fire. To yeah, train. exactly. I've yeah. always wanted to prove something to someone and yeah. it just was another situation where I had to do that. Yeah, it is. I mean, you know, people always say like, oh, do it for yourself or everything. But like, I think it's really important to find anything that motivates you to really, really work hard and tap I, into that. I think I do like I don't do as well. If, I do it for myself, of course. But when I find other reasons like, oh, that coach doubted me mm-hmm. or, oh, my family wants me to do that. Like it's much more motivating than doing it for myself. Like mm-hmm. I I don't think I care that much <laughs> if it were just for me. Like yeah. that added pressure of like, <laughs> oh, my family is watching, make them proud or mm-hmm. oh, these coaches doubted me, which I I think I go into every week and go on. I emailed this coach in an off season. He didn't respond. Yeah. Stuff like that. Yeah. Like I take that super personal. Mm-hmm. And I think it's good. I mean, it's sometimes people don't talk about it, but it's like at the end of the day, what gets you to play your absolute best yeah. and tap into that? Cause like same thing, like whatever I think it was, I think it was Michael Jordan was saying that he would invent imaginary situations and arguments against other players. <clears throat> Yeah, I love that. Like, that just it never even happened. But he's like, "Oh, you know, screw this guy. Yeah. He talked shit about me when it never happened." But it's like you can see how that would help him. And of course, like him coming out and saying that, people are like, "Oh, he's a jerk. All this stuff is whatever." But like, he's the goat for a reason. Like yeah. that, he was that mental about winning and and doing that that he's willing to even create something fake that never happened just to fuel him. Yeah, which is crazy. Trevor James used to say that before games or or a day before a game. He goes, "Look, big game tomorrow." Find your motivation mm-hmm. to, to play hard or, or find what you're doing it for. Because mm-hmm. whether it's for money, which is fine, if you're doing it for your family, for legacy, anything like that. If you find your reason, you could tap in and be your the best version of yourself, then that's that's what you got to do. And mm-hmm. if you have to make up fake scenarios, then that'll work as well. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's crazy. It's crazy. Um, and then how was the whole season with Richmond? Again, it was like a roller coaster because I got named captain at the beginning of the season, which was exciting. But now looking back at it, like it was such a big responsibility for mm-hmm. a guy who was just trying to focus on having a complete season. So I was I went there just to be like, look, do well, do everything you can to like mm-hmm. help the team, of course. But to then add the captaincy was a lot of pressure of like, well, now I have to make sure like I can help these guys like off the field or be a leader when. In reality, I just needed to focus on me playing. Mm-hmm. So I think that was tough. I think us losing a bunch of games was really tough. Mm-hmm. Um, and that transition of like, well, now I'm losing. I'm the captain of a losing team. Like it was just overwhelming. Mm-hmm. 
but I was still playing well. I was playing as a six. I probably still wasn't in the best shape. I was probably not doing the right things off the field just because mentally I wasn't in the right state with all the losing and stuff like that. A 10 month seasons, a long time to be going through stuff like that. So again, a moment of like, now it's reflection because at the time there's so many people that I blamed. Mm-hmm. And then now looking back, what I learned was then I stopped pointing the finger at, oh, he's the reason why this happened. Oh, that coach did that to me and mm-hmm. stuff like that. And there was like a realization like, okay, just look in the mirror and like realize that they weren't the problem. I wasn't doing the right stuff off the field. So again, it was a tough year soccer wise, but I learned so much that helped me on, I think now or last two seasons mm-hmm. for sure. And professionalism, it was a step up from like the first year of San Antonio still. So you still weren't like all the way there, it sounds, but you were making progress like eating the right things, taking care of your body, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I was definitely doing better, but not as well as I should have. And it was also tough because you go from San Antonio where they treat you like really well and you have all the resources. Mm -hmm. And of course, Richmond was treating us well, but you don't have the same resources that you did at San Antonio. So it was kind of like a humbling experience. Like, oh, not every club had the hot tubs before training (laughs) Mm -hmm. or had three trainers on staff or had this many coaches or had this nice of a locker room. So it was an eye-opening experience that like you never take anything for granted mm-hmm. like I did the first two years of that yeah. uh, San Antonio. Yeah, that makes sense. And then after after that season ended with Richmond, what happened in that offseason? So my agent at the time was like, um, look, things didn't go that well, but you got a lot of minutes under your belt. You, you played well whenever you, you played. I pl- you, how many games did you play in that year? I think 32. Yeah, I think out good. of 34, I played 32. That's really good. So I was like, okay, I showed what I can do. Mm -hmm. The USO championship team will will try to sign me. And at the time we had played in Open Cup, we played North Carolina FC. Mm -hmm. Funny enough, the team we play tomorrow. Yeah. And they, the coach then was telling me, hey, really good player after the game, stuff like that. And I had contacted them after the Richmond year and they invited me to finish their season just training wise. Mm -hmm. And I was out of contract and I was doing okay and i told richmond hey please don't pick up my option like i'm trying to jump up like Mm -hmm. just a mutual agreement they cool with that yeah they were really cool with it at the time so um so that happened and in my head i'm like all right north carolina fc maybe that'll happen and then they were like hey we're not gonna sign you which was okay because i was only there for for two weeks and got to experience that so that was cool but yeah, I was like, all right, USL Championship's coming. And like every off season, you're like, all right, it's coming. My agent's like, yeah, it'll come. All right, mm-hmm. two weeks. Haven't heard anything. Oh, okay. You see all these guys getting signed. And then come Christmas, nothing. Family's asking. Mentally, I'm like, I don't know what's going on. Yeah. And then fell off like, oh, I'm just going to have fun. Something's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Enjoying the off season. Um, yeah. And then nothing, nothing came. <laughs> It's funny the mindsets and the way people players talk about that in the offseason because every player handles it differently. Some players are, oh, I'm talking to this club, this club, this club, this t- club, yeah. and they're exaggerating what they're doing almost to help themselves mentally. Like I'm, yeah. I'm talking. Don't For worry, sure. a lot of clubs are interested. Other players just go like, oh, I don't even care, man. Like who, you know, out here having fun. If it happens, it happens. Other players are just vocal with their stress. Like I can't sleep tonight, bro. I had I haven't slept in all week. The mentality of every player in that free agency spell is so interesting to me about how each player handles that stress. Yeah, I used to be, my first couple of years, I was telling my parents, oh, this team's like interested in, this team's interested, which interested was like, they just responded to an email. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then as uh, time went by, I realized, look, look, I'm not going to BS anyone. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, mom, no one's reached out. Mm -hmm. I'm stressed about it. I'm worried about it. That was a lot better for my mental state than Mm -hmm. to just fake it till you make it yeah in my opinion like that was just my the way i dealt with it best so yeah tough times for sure the worst is i've been in periods where it's like late a club and my agent like oh they're so interested um we start talking numbers we start talking year of the con to your contracts like a full text of like would you agree to all these numbers at this point i'm so yes. nervous i'm like yes 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 just give me but the like, paper give me the papers i'll sign it and then backside if something falls through yeah. i've literally been that close like multiple times and then and then you go for weeks i think that next week or two weeks of silence and not hearing anything after you were so close is the hardest like 
it's it's mentally draining you were sometimes. right there yeah the finish line was right there mm-hmm. i don't think before detroit i don't think i've ever received an offer and was like no yeah every offer she i ended up signing because mm-hmm. i only got one from san antonio because i was there for preseason richmond was last second there was nothing there and then besides that there's never been an off season where i'm like oh i have this this, this team and mm-hmm. that team and this team it was always like hey what's gonna happen mm-hmm. besides like but the transition between Nice of Detroit and championship was the only year of like, Hey, is this, yeah. you get, am I in it or not? And it was still like a couple of weeks where I didn't know if I was in the plant. Mm-hmm. And the, and the hard part too, is like, even when you have a great season where you think, Oh, multiple clubs are going to be coming after me. A lot of times too, a club will reach out and be like, okay, you have 48 hours to decide, or we're going a different direction. So then you're like, Oh, it's November. This is a decent offer. Do I, take this or do i keep on just rolling with my yeah, chances see, I've, I've never like had it have never had an off season where like this team's like maybe interested this team also like they're both yeah. or this team gave me 48 hours like i've never gone through really an off season of mm-hmm. being a free agent to where i'm like oh like they can yeah. contact me like it's it's always been like no one's contacted me <laughs> and then i just sign at the end yeah, to the first yeah, yeah. team that does offer me something <laughs> <laughs> it's so nerve-wracking yeah it's funny and I, it's funny i'll have other people on here who just i don't want to say it's a luck thing but like because they're obviously they deserve and what they're getting but like there is some times where the stars align a lot quicker and easier for some for some even i've had years i've had years where i have had multiple when it's like it's not been that much better of a season than other seasons where i've gone into the third week of january but now i have two clubs in because it's a lot of times it's like are are the right backs staying put in the around the league are the right backs moving do you have a lot of right backs retiring like what's it looking like yeah so it's like a lot of external variables too which is always interesting sometimes the seasons is just unfortunate you haven't had a, a stress-free easy off season yeah no never <laughs> hopefully it will come yeah maybe we'll see <laughs> um so then so what happened so now how to talk about the transition from richmond in this tough off season and then to detroit how did that happen? What was that like? Because again, you said it was a stressful one, but yeah. So between Richmond and Detroit, I had a year where I had no club. Oh yeah. So yeah, 2021, yeah, 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 yeah. which ended up being COVID year, but before that, like I didn't have a club, and mm-hmm. then COVID hit, mm-hmm. and then it was kind of like, well, no one's playing, and people were playing, but that was like the biggest, probably the the most life changing year when it comes to soccer outside of soccer. It just changed everything for mm-hmm. me. So from going from Richmond thinking, oh, USL teams will talk to me, to then that offseason being stressful, and then being like, hey, no club has mm-hmm. signed you. And you see teams are having preseason. You see all this, and you're like, well, maybe I'll get a trial. Nothing's happening. And then COVID hits. So you, at even at this point, not a single club has even invited you in for a trial? No. Oh, actually, yes. Mm-hmm. And it was San Antonio. Okay, again. So that was a year that I went on trial with San Antonio. Sorry, I completely forgot about yeah. it. So I get a call and saying, hey, hey, we want to sign you. And I'm going, I'm coming home. Like, mm-hmm. All right, coming back. The legend returns. <laughs> More minutes <laughs> under my belt. Like, yeah, yeah. for sure, like, I'm going to sign back home. I'm telling everyone. <laughs> I'm telling everyone, hey, I'm coming back. My mom are coming back. Mm-hmm. And then they're like, my agent's like, yep, we're just waiting on the offer sheet. I'm like, all right, mm-hmm. an off season where I'm chilling. Yeah. And then never came. And then I received a call and said, hey, we still want you to come in for preseason. And I'm so fixated on, I'm coming home. Like, I want to come home. I was homesick. San Antonio, I realized that there's things outside of San Antonio that were not as nice facilities and stuff like that. So I'm like, I want to come back here. Mm -hmm. Not realizing that it was going to be mentally super tough to go into a locker room where I knew a lot of the guys. Uh, I knew the training staff. I knew the coaches. They know me, but I'm coming on trial. Mm -hmm. So even just walking into the locker room, and being in the trialist locker room, like that was mentally very tough. And being asked by other trialists, didn't you play here already? Like that was like, well, shit. Yeah, I did. <laughs> but this happened like constantly, like having to explain yeah. your situation. It was mentally so tough that, again, wasn't fit for preseason like I should have been. Mm-hmm. I thought I could skate by. Because you've been there before. Because I've been there before. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I, I get so overwhelmed mentally in the off season sometimes so stressed that instead of getting lost, like I do get lost in training, Mm -hmm. doing the right things to give myself that confidence. 
I would do the opposite. I would just be like, nah, like, I don't want to train. Like, I'm mm-hmm. pissed off or I'm upset that I don't have a contract. So, again, I didn't go in very fit. Had a meeting with the coach at the end of preseason. And it was already late into preseason by then saying, hey, we just don't see you as a center mid for this team. We don't think you're mobile enough. And that was the reason because you weren't mobile enough, which is insane to think about. Which is insane. And at the time, you could have been right. Again, that's something that I realized then. Like, I was going, they didn't think I was mobile enough. Like, they don't know anything. They're wrong. They're wrong. Yeah. And then I look back and I was like, maybe I wasn't. Maybe I wasn't in the best shape. Maybe I still had a little bit of tamal in me. (laughs) Yeah. Maybe Christmas was too fun. (laughs) Maybe too many tamales. So that was when COVID happened. And it was either like, okay, this team doesn't want me Mm -hmm. now i have no club people are asking me what are you doing your whole identity is soccer Mm -hmm. oh max the soccer guy oh he's a professional blah 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 and suddenly i wasn't that guy anymore which was super tough um and then covid hit and i'm still not doing the right things because i'm i'm pissed at the world Mm -hmm. i'm blaming other people and then covid hit and i go look i i can either no one's playing soccer i can either get super fit do everything in my power to to try to keep this thing going or I'm done. Mm-hmm. So what am I going to do? And I was like, well, I'm not very good at anything else. <laughs> I don't have my degree. Yeah. No one's playing. So I'm not missing out on anything. Mm-hmm. So let's, let's just train. Mm-hmm. So then from that point on, I just trained every single day, twice a day, three times a day, working DoorDash. Really? Uh, working as a UPS um, driver during the holiday. So I would literally drive my car, go up to a, a UPS truck. They'd put a hundred packages in my car mm-hmm. and I'd deliver it in my car. And then I'd go straight from there to work out there to then DoorDash a bit. But I was training insane amount. I was running like in a week, probably like 70 miles. <laughs> like I was just going crazy, mm-hmm. just getting lost in it. Yeah. Going, if an opportunity comes, it's not going to be because I'm not fit. Yeah. It's because I'm not because I'm not prepared. It's mm-hmm. because it's just not meant to be. So I, I was going, I'm going to go out on my own terms rather than because I didn't do the right things. And then I point the finger and say, that's because of him. Or I'm not here because that guy didn't like me. Or I just blaming other people for what's going on in my life. Mm-hmm. Damn. I love that. That's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. So you're door dashing, doing everything, just hustling. And I think what's really, really crazy is that to keep the mindset to train like that and to put in the work when you don't really, it, nobody even knows when footy's going to come back. You don't even have a club to come back to. Like it's hard. And yeah. it, like I always found the easiest time to train is when you have a contract already. Oh yeah. I need to be fit by February 15th for this preseason, for this fitness test. When you have nothing, you're like, Sometimes you're like, what am I even doing this Dude, for? A hundred percent. I'm waking up going, I'm waking up at 5 a.m. And I'm about to train. I'm like, what? Why am I not just stay asleep? Like, mm-hmm. what am I doing this for? Like, really? Like, nothing's coming up. Mm-hmm. No one's playing. My agent said that no one wants me on trial. Like, what am I doing? And then you just have to, like, overcome that and just keep going and going. And so were you going. just trained by yourself? Or you what were you running? Just running miles in the streets? So, like, what did your training look like? Um, so I'd wake up and I'd, it depends on the day, but most of the day I just like cones out dribbling Mm -hmm. sprints with the ball, technical work. I'd have three balls. So I'd literally pretend to turn, ping a ball, do that three times, go chase the ball. (laughs) And then I'd run after and I'm just running. Um, I'm doing hit workouts. I'm doing burpees. I'm doing all that. Doing some proper Dan Trosper workouts. Dan Trosper would have loved me during COVID. (laughs) So I'm doing hit workouts uh, in the evening, mm-hmm. and then I'm running these like farlick. Is that yeah, what fartlek? Yeah. So I'm hitting farlick runs, and I'm just that's when I was watching your videos. Really? Yeah. And I would just learn. Oh, these are good drills that I could do alone, or mm-hmm. these are sprints that I could do. And yeah, I was just doing that constantly, constantly. If I was bored in the house for too long, I was like, I I gotta go work. Yeah. Like yeah. the more I work, the more confidence I have in myself, and then and I don't have to like worry mm-hmm. in my head. Yeah. That my COVID was super similar. Like I was like, what else am I gonna do? Like same, so bored. And I was like, well, I'm just gonna do the same thing. Runs in the morning, like in the videos, training at some random park, hitting the ball off a log. Like I was just like, same thing. I was like, I just want to come back 
and have my best season. Because everybody else, I was thinking everybody, or not everybody else, but a lot of players are, just, are slacking off yeah. right now. And I can come back flying. Because I was like, as soon as it comes back, it's going to hit the ground running. We're going to go. That's exactly what happened. They had like two weeks, a two-week mini preseason in the USL. And then it was back into the games. Yeah. And a lot of guys were not fully fit at the time. And I remember I was talking to a buddy of mine, Mikey, and he was um, telling me, like, we like, I don't know if the season's going to happen. Like, mm-hmm. I know you don't have a team, but maybe it's going to work out. Like, no one's going to play. Mikey Lopez? Yeah. yeah. And I was like, no one's going to play. And I was like, okay. And then he was like, hey, we're starting the season. They started uh, games back. And I'm like, damn, like, it's not ideal for me. A trial opened up last second canceled like mm-hmm. just random things like that and i'm like this is terrible mm-hmm. like what am i doing this for but yeah just was grinding it's tough <laughs> and then when did you hear about detroit um i remember i was at my girlfriend's apartment and i just received a, a random call from my agent and he's like hey um detroit um city is a anisa team and at the time i was like I and what, what what part of the year is this is this an off season? This is an off season. I think late in an off season. Mm-hmm. So you kept up that training all for, all, all summer, all, all fall, I all was, of the off season. I was nonstop. Wow, because that's I, that's almost a year. Yeah, right? and I could see the results. Like my whole life, or at least the last like couple of years, like I even thought I was fit. I mm-hmm. was like, I'm fit, and I never was like super fit. Mm-hmm. Like I'd even have my family members like not call me tamal or. Uh, <laughs> Torta, but they would be like, oh, you're a bigger guy. And I'm yeah. always be like, what do you mean? This is just my body type. I yeah, used to say is, that a lot. Yeah. This is my body type. Mm-hmm. And then I got so fit. I was like, oh, that was not my body type. Yeah. I was just making excuses. Mm-hmm. So then I got like, I got super fit and I got addicted to like how I felt, yeah. how I looked. And I was like, this is what I should have been. Mm-hmm. And I'm playing like Sunday league and I feel unbelievable. <laughs> and I was just happy to be like, okay, well, I did everything. I didn't get a team. And then Trevor just randomly called me and was like, introduce Nisa and all that stuff. And I was like, I'm going down what felt like going down another Mm -hmm. league, right? You go from league one to then, but I had no club to Nisa. But then I go, look, I thought I was going to retire. Yeah, it's better than nothing. And Trevor was like, come see if you like it, which was more like, I think, see if we like you, Mm -hmm. like a trial. And then, yeah, I figured, hey, if I'm going to play one more year, and then retire okay but let's just have fun and mm-hmm. see what happens and yeah ended up in detroit because i think a lot of players would have once the season started back up and you get that first trial that then fell through that's where a lot of people would have stopped like with your like training of getting the most fit because it's like for me i was even thinking like like okay once the season starts back up that's the end goal and then if it would start and i would see that and then i have a trial falls through it's like that would be tough. And yeah. Then go back into another off season now out for a year, which you know is really tough to find a team after that. That's that's not easy. Yeah, I think I, I think I said in my interview the other day, like I have been at rock bottom. Mm-hmm. So like I'm comfortable there now. Mm-hmm. Like I'm I'm comfortable being in that uncomfortable situation of like no one wants you, nothing's mm-hmm. going on. Like I'm fine with that. I've been there before. I'm not scared of it anymore. Mm-hmm. So I was like, I'm just gonna keep going. And, and hope something happens. And then Detroit called and that ultimately changed the trajectory of my career. Yeah. I, I had something super similar where it was like I was with Orange County Blues, St. Louis FC. And St. Louis FC was a, such a well-run professional organization. Got injured, two surgeries, led into the next 2018 season. No teams were calling. Or teams were calling me, but they're all like, yeah, we need to see you on trial. And I'm like, well, I'm getting surgery February 18th. And they're like, all right, bye. Yeah. And I was like, and the same thing, preseason starting up. And like, I had to go to New Zealand and play at a lower level. It's still good. Like, you can find good leagues and good players anywhere. Sunday league, you're still playing at a decent level, but like, rock bottom of like, I am literally playing twice a week right now with this team at a very lower level than I'm used to. It's just not professional. And you're like, it's so hard to do that. But then once you should be like, oh, yeah, I still recovered, I still survived it. Then it's like, yeah, well, I'm just going to keep on going because you've been there. And you're like, that's not that big of a deal. Yeah, I can do that again. I can take another year of that. And so like for reaching that for that one year in 2018 helped me so much for the next few years. So I'm like, I got nothing to lose. Like, so just play, do go treat it like it could be your last year, but just keep on working. It's not that scary. It sucks, but like you'll survive it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I think that's the biggest thing. I Every year I think about 
the year I didn't have a club mm -hmm. and then realizing what you have and realizing, Hey, might as well go for it. You've mm -hmm. been rock bottom before. If that happens and it happens, like at least go out on, on your terms and doing, and during COVID, like when I was playing Sunday league, I like found love for soccer mm -hmm. again. Like you go through so much adversity that you're like, do I even still like, like this? Like it's so tough. But then I was playing Sunday league and, and enjoying the atmosphere that you have with like those guys <laughs> who are literally working nine to five yeah. and then come play. And you're like, this is so much fun. You mm -hmm. realize why you do it, why you started doing it. And then you're like, all right, like you realize that's your why, like you do it because you love it and I'm going to fight for it. Mm -hmm. So then, so you, this is your fourth season at Detroit city. Yeah. So how, I know this is a big question, but over the last three seasons and a little bit into this fourth um, how's that been going from Nisa, Nisa Nations or and Nisa Independent Cup wasn't the first? No clue. There was like, <laughs> there was like, there was like 17 trophies in one season yeah. and we were fighting for, and I was just like, how is there more trophies? I remember talking to somebody, a couple of friends in Nisa and I was like, explain what's going on. <laughs> we <laughs> didn't, we didn't know what was going on. <laughs> Armando was trying to explain it. I'm like trying to watch the, I was watching the Detroit city games because of Armando and of other players I knew around the league and that were having their starts at other Nisa teams. And I just would try to dive in and understand it. And there, that first couple of years, I was like, well, I, I don't know. There's two seasons now. There's one season. The, there's Independent Cup. There's Nisa Nations. Yeah, we had no clue what was going on. But there's on. just a lot of games, which is there's good. Just, That's what yeah, you Yeah, there's a lot of games. And it was fun being... I remember talking to Trevor. I was like, I'm just happy to be training with other people. <laughs> like training alone. I'm not pinging balls to nobody and having to run after it yeah, anymore. Yeah, Training was like unbelievable. Like mm -hmm. just being around guys, being in the locker room. Like you just that stuff you miss a lot whenever you're not playing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was an overwhelming year cause I was playing a bunch, but then you're like, people are congratulating you. But then I know people are like, Oh, it's just Nisa though. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? People mm -hmm. look down on it. You know what I mean, I still think about those were like some of the hardest games I've ever played mm -hmm. because there's guys like who are just fighting mm -hmm. for to, to like continue their dream. You know what I mean? So like you have guys who are like back against the wall, like, trying everything to get to that next level like and yeah i i learned a lot from playing around those guys and mm -hmm. it was really fun and then so the first year was nice <laughs> i'm trying to break it down it was a like bit. first year was nisa that yes. was 2021 for you right 2022 that was 2022 or 21 at the end it, okay 21 i think it was 2021 so the covid was 2020 yeah okay that was my yeah yeah, yeah. i always get them mixed up don't worry i've studied your career oh yeah yeah 2021 yeah, yeah that was 2021 because my first year they had 21 because mm -hmm. of the year on all the jerseys they sold uh, and my mom's like oh my gosh <laughs> everyone has your jersey on and i'm like that's just a coincidence but yeah mom they do it's all for me it's all for me yeah so then 21 was the first year and that was nisa 2022 that was the first year in Championship. championship yeah and i remember because i was watching your guys's games in nisa and i would I remember seeing the fans in the crowd I'm like that's an awesome atmosphere yeah. that's sick so, so. and then when i saw you guys coming up from the championship i was stoked because i'm like oh sweet we're gonna play there in that atmosphere but i was skeptical to see how you guys were going to transition from nisa to usl championship because as being here you're like oh it's not going to be an easy transition but you guys came out and did really really well your first year yeah I think we were all nervous yeah. about that year. And I think the guys that were coming up from Nisa, at least in my head, I was like, I'm just happy to be back in the USO championship. Like mm -hmm. I had no clue I was ever going to be back at that level. Yeah. I thought it was kind of done for me. And then to be back there, I was like, I remember that off season. I went insane as well. Like I was like, I'm going to be so fit. Mm -hmm. We brought in some signings that were already in the USO championship before. So I'm like, they're the starters in yeah. my head. Like I got to be better than them. But yeah, I think we were all nervous about it. I think I remember going in, we were having like discussions within the players. Like we're not Man City of the league anymore, mm -hmm. obviously. It's like we're fighting for relegation. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like we're one of the bottom teams and mm -hmm. we're going to have to grind out results. We're going to have to like hope we get a couple wins. In our head, that's what we thought, mm -hmm. which is natural because it's such a big jump organization-wise like yeah. to go from Nisa to USL Championship, mm -hmm. at least in my head. Mm -hmm. So we thought it was going to be a really, really tough year of like hopefully getting a couple wins. And then, yeah, and then we just surprised everyone, yeah. I think. I know. I was in that first home opener game at, with Charleston. 
And I was thinking, okay, like I don't want I mean, I guess I was a little complacent, like over oh, complaining at basically a Nisa team. Yeah. And most of the team was Nisa. I think. And we got smack in the face and we you scored that game, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, that first half though, I was I remember you have halves where you're like, I don't know if I can be in the USL championship. <laughs> like this is fast, this yeah. is tough, especially at like, Keyworth or when it's mm-hmm. wet, like it's just a different monster. And then the second half. I scored and mm-hmm. I got, I remember this cause I take all these things personal. Mm-hmm. I got team of the week and I was like, Oh, this stuff's not that bad. <laughs> you could have a bad half and have team of the week. Like what the heck? This is easy. I literally had a terrible game. Yeah. Scored a goal. And I was like, team of the week. Mm-hmm. No big deal. Mm-hmm. I remember that first half too. Cause I, I don't want to say we were like on you, but no, we, you like, were on us. Cause we had hit the crossbar. I think we hit the post. I think we had a couple shots that we missed. It was overwhelming for sure. And then, and I remember we had a lot of momentum, but then second half, it shifted like a lot. And I remember thinking like, like we couldn't get it. I think we lost a little confidence. And then, yeah, then we had that your goal. And I was like, oh, that sucks. Yeah. Now, every time I see about Detroit City's inaugural game in the USL <laughs> championship, I see myself head down as you running off, <laughs> you, Antoine Pato, all running yeah. off to the side. It's funny because um, Antoine was like, he's so experienced and he had like mm. so many uh, years He'd in probably the been South. over 200 professional games at that point. Yeah, and he had this confidence like, guys, we're going to be good. Mm-hmm. Like, we're good. After a preseason, like, we're going to be good. Mm-hmm. And us Nisa guys, we were still like, we doubted it. Mm-hmm. Like, we were like, I don't know. Like, And then we just needed that confidence mm-hmm. of like one good result. And we're like, oh, we like belong. Yeah. Like, I don't know why we thought we didn't. Mm-hmm. Like, we're, we It's just, hard. It's It's, I mean, I would have the same thoughts. I even thought that like, uh my first time playing like there's so much imposter syndrome like i literally thought all these guys are pros yeah and i'm i'm somehow snuck my way onto this field with them i still think that all the time really yeah i was thinking about it this week because they're that that celebration i had i keep getting roasted at the field (laughs) i'm him i'm him i'm him but there's there's so many times i go home and i'm like i don't know how this stuff's happening yeah like i i don't know because like it never happened before, mm. but it just shows that like when you put the work in, you get lost in the work, like good things happen. Mm-hmm. And I'm a firm believer of like good things will happen to good people and people that work hard. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I think the, honestly, the thing that's helped me most with like the imposter syndrome is this podcast. And cause you hear every single player who you would be like, Oh, their careers or whatever. Like the, and then they talk about all the ups and downs and how they doubted it. And they're like, like grind like those mental thoughts in off season with like i thought it was gonna be done or whatever you hear those stories you're like wow like not everybody's had this golden you know elevator up to the championship or wherever they played it's like everybody grinds for especially at this level yeah. everybody grinds for their their contracts and i think it's important that people like hear everyone's story you mm-hmm. hear different stories because i think from the outside in you look at guys having success you're like why well, can't there's this bad habit of going like why is he having that yeah and people are like, their situation was so easy and yeah, stuff like that. Yeah. And that's our perception of the person. And then you realize like, no, they like mm-hmm. went through some hard times or they've gone through, got out of some tough situations mm-hmm. for the better and, and they're having success now. Bro, even like getting the 100 USL appearances, I, I getting 150, bro, I was like, bro, I remember I, because my first year of college, I dropped out and I didn't get sign my first pro contract for a year and a half. So it was a full year and a half of just, going on trials, jumping around, doing this, doing that, getting told no, 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 no. And I was like, I'm working so hard. I was like, if I could just get one game, one game at the pro level, one contract. Yeah. And I went to Iceland, was told no. I went to Vancouver Whitecaps too with Brett. I got cut there. I went to uh, Combines, San Jose Earthquakes Combine. Then I was like all around, just told no, no, no. Germany, I went to like 10 different teams, told no. Sacramento Republic told me no. I trained with them the whole season, came back uh finally orange county said yes and i got my first and i was like okay I'm, I'm happy now i got and i then i got pushed in the starting lineup immediately and that's where i was like i don't deserve to be on this field yeah, right now i crazy. snuck my way in and then all of a sudden you're thinking 150 was like how hard you work just for that one appearance and it's just crazy to like where it all comes and you're just like yeah and then you see 150 now or 100 and you're like oh these guys have just been killing it it's easy yeah but it's it's Dude, not it's, grind. it's not yeah that's crazy how did you go a year and a half like you ask people like how they kept going like, how'd you keep going after a year and a half Bro, like, like going different countries like i i'm still uncomfortable with the idea of like going to another country to play but like 
you just dropped out of college a year and a half of like getting mm-hmm. no's like that's crazy yeah bro the well the first one in iceland well first even before us it was oklahoma city energy they were like yep we want you we're gonna bring you in and then both coaches got fired in the off season they had some legal trouble back in england and then all of a sudden the emails went blank nothing I was like, crap. I was like, okay, well, Portland Timbers 2 was talking to me. Then they went silent. And so like all this stuff, and I was like, okay, whatever. But like what, honestly, it was like my dad just saying like, look, you were literally like, you have professional teams saying they're going to sign you, doing all this for you. If you quit now, you're going to regret this for the rest of your life. Yeah. And he kept on saying that. And I was like, that's true. Like I'm literally right here. And then in Germany, I had another time where I was like, so this is over a year now of me bouncing around on trials, being a practice player, Tough. training. T- training on my own, training in like crazy places wherever I'm going on trials. Like I'm in V spot in Germany, training on a dirt field. Insane. And then, but I was like, okay, I'm just gonna get it. I'm gonna get it. And then I finally was on trial with this team for like two weeks, and they were playing in the fourth league of Germany, the Rego Now Liga, which is a good level. It's not fully professional, but you have professional contracts, professional players there. And uh, like the team had said, okay, we're gonna give you 1,500 euros a month apartment with another korean kid so you guys will have your two-bedroom apartment all your bonuses here's what you're doing you're signed here for the rest of this season and then we'll talk about signing you for the next season i was like this is this is it yeah finally you got it and he's like okay awesome you agree to it i'm like yep i agree i'm I'm (laughs) set i'm set and then they're like okay sweet come in on sunday to sign the contract and i was like yes let's go and so i was in my airbnb I was like on this with four other, there's like other girls like in the room. I was just rented. I was like just one room at the time. And then I was like, I had no uh, data. So I just stayed in the room all Sunday, just with my phone on my desk. I was just watching Netflix, but every second I was like tapping the phone. The phone call never came. I guess the sponsor, because you have sponsors in Germany for all the players that will pay your contract. He backed out and said, no, we, I think we have too many players already. So then I was like, and that's when I was like, dad, I'm done. Yeah. Coming back buy me a ticket home i'm done like i have no money i'm I'm done but he that's when he's like you're gonna regret this for the rest of your life that's sick though that your yeah. dad just kept going that's yeah. how my he parents- literally said no he's like no you're gonna regret that for the rest of your life yeah i was having the tough conversations during COVID with my parents it's like i think i'm done mm-hmm. and my mom's like why i'm like mom like i'm i'm making no money like i'm just here living at your guys place like this it's just getting bad like mm-hmm. I, I can't do this anymore and they're like what do you have to lose? Like, we've seen you play before. We know you're good enough. Like, sometimes you have to have other people believe in mm-hmm. you to make you start believing in yourself, mm-hmm. which was huge mm-hmm. for, like, my family. My family believed in me and pushed me when I didn't believe in myself. Yeah. Yeah, my dad did the same thing. Like, my mom was like, oh, no, is this, I, is, he's sad. Bring him home. But she would support me. I'll tell him that, like, as my dad, she's just like, nope. He's like, you got no money. You're not coming home. You can't yeah. buy a ticket. <laughs> yeah. He said, I'm not buying it for you, so you're going to stay over there. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, it's crazy no, it's, sick, it's crazy yeah but it works out but you gotta you need to have like your circle of people that help you and also your own like at the same times and hopefully you know both will bring you up as you're going through your whole yeah, career for sure um and now you got 100 appearances hopefully usl player of the month hopefully things are going hopefully we continue this for the rest of the season north carolina tomorrow Thinking nice little hat trick from you. Yeah. I'm all, I just hope to get one man. <laughs> that's for three. Yeah. That's awesome. And then so now overall, like we've covered a lot of your career. Um, what do you think was has been the absolute highest high as a pro? Because we've talked a lot about the lows and the grind, but like what has been the absolute best period or moment throughout your whole career? Probably two goals, open cup against Columbus Crew. That first year in USL Championship, um, yeah, we went down 1-0. Naturally, you play against an MLS team, you're like, oh, they scored in the first. Who scored? Uh, Zardes mm. scored a pen. <laughs> He's at Q where scoring a pen. You're like, it's early in the game. This is going to get ugly quick. Mm-hmm. And yeah, we just were playing really well, and I was able to, to score two, and we came back to win. And I remember just like being in that moment and just realizing that all your hard work and like, it just felt like a like a movie it was like unreal Mm -hmm. and then having my family calling me crying like so proud of me like it was just a moment that i'll probably never forget just solidified like everything i'd been working for and the fact that i belonged where where i was it was like a really cool experience Mm -hmm. because then two years before that you were literally contractless yeah. training on your own without a club and now i'm scoring it's playing pass by yourself yeah and I'm then sc- it went to nisa in the grind through the mud and then now you're scoring two goals on an mls team 
that's crazy yeah i definitely it's surreal even think about it or watching video like still makes me like want to cry just because it was so overwhelming like getting that justification like hey like good things happen and i belong stuff like that because mm-hmm. even then i was like how am i in the uso championship yeah. and i was yeah. scoring goals and i was like how am i scoring goals like <laughs> these teams are are bad or what's going yeah. on and then that moment happened i was like all right i think i'm pretty good like, yeah let's just keep going see see where this can take you mm-hmm. and then my my last question i have for you is is just uh a lot of people that listen to this also you know are kids that want to follow in your footsteps and become a pro what is hard, but what piece of advice do you have for them to to push them to become a pro? What's helped you? If you could go back in time and tell your younger self something, like what's one overarching piece of advice that you would have for them? Probably multiple layers to this question, but I think putting all your work into then having no excuses, right? Because at the end of the day, what you put in is what you're going to get. And if you blame other people, if you say they're the reason this didn't happen or that didn't happen, then things aren't going to go well. But if you work hard, take control what you can, um, good things are going to happen, whether it's in soccer, whether it's in life, people that work hard and continue to get lost in their work, good things are going to happen. And uh, yeah, that's something I try to wake up and tell myself on the days where you get up and you're like, I don't want to do this. Mm-hmm. You got to get lost in the work and, and work hard. And then the um, the results will come. Mm-hmm. Love it. Awesome. And then anything else? Anything else we didn't cover? No, I don't think oh, so. Oh, one, one, one more thing. One oh, more thing. no. <laughs> you have a tattoo. Oh, in an, in an no. Area, in an area where the pre- sun, where there's not much sun that gets to it. Yeah. Tell me the story about this tattoo. So I have a, a butt tattoo <laughs> and it says F F L L in beautiful cursive. Writing. It's nice. I've looked at it yeah, in the he's, shower. He's, I'm like, what's that yeah. say? With a, with a 21 and people think it's like a significant thing in my life, mm-hmm. which is crazy. Cause why would I put it on my butt? <laughs> and they're like, is that your soccer number? I'm like, well it is, but it means fantasy football league loser 2021. <laughs> so I got last place in my fantasy football league. And that is our punishment every year. So there's about five guys somewhere <laughs> in San Antonio also yeah. that have a butt tattoo that says FFLL. And I have the nicest one. There's guys with huge block letters. Do other people get to choose what it looks like? So like did, No, 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 no. So Thank you got to choose your... Yeah, I was like, okay. if I'm getting a tattoo, it's going to be nice. Yeah. Because I matter. have guys, friends, they got it in Vegas, which is probably the worst place to get it. When yeah, you're not, tough. You're not entirely in the right mindset, <laughs> but they have like huge block letters. And it's huge. They saw mine. They're like, what the heck? I'm like, well, you never told me I had to get your letters. Like, yeah. But yeah, the worst part is I have a tweet that same year going, my friends let me in their fantasy football league loser. Um, they're going to re- like, I'm five and zero at the time. I'm like, they, that was the worst possible thing they could have done. Like I'm winning it easy. And then they took screenshots and made t-shirts out of it. Cause I ended <laughs> up getting the butt tattoo. <laughs> that's amazing so uh, next time in san Di- uh san antonio i'm gonna find those other guys I'll yeah be- <laughs> i have a picture of all of us together but the craziest thing is i tell them this all the time they don't have to shower around other guys yeah and it's a different group sometimes every season mm-hmm. so uh, they're just their significant other wives may see it every now and then but sorry friendly family friendly <laughs> podcast <laughs> they're married family friendly <laughs> podcast um sorry brother sorry brother um but yeah, I have guys randomly yeah. see it at all the time. They're like, what's that uh, What's that butt tattoo? And I have to explain it every year. Yeah, that's tough. And now, now a lot of people. Thousands or millions of people are going to hear I have a butt send tattoo. Send me a photo of you just naked and I'll throw it in the podcast. <laughs> okay. Also, I have trainers who sometimes you train oh, me. Yeah. They have to like do my <laughs> upper glute. And they're like, what the heck is this butt tattoo? So yeah. Oh, well, yeah. My mom hates it. But she's like, at least it's your soccer number. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah you, should, you should find a different like abbreviation like in your head like fastest footballer that's already wrong though fastest <laughs> yeah. i'm the slowest guy on my team besides Murph. sorry Ooh. probably in the last like five years i'm always the slowest oh, even man. covid year i was the slowest on my team you gotta find out i would be lying every every single time fastest footballer live <laughs> long <laughs> <laughs> live long 21 all right awesome well maxi thank you so much for coming on the podcast i really appreciate it your story is awesome and uh yeah
Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me, man. Of course. Mm-hmm.